going live. Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Landscape Photography. It's great to have you here with us tonight. Um, and tonight we've got a pretty awesome show lined up with uh, Paul Holland and Scott Patelli. Uh, Paul's obviously no stranger to the show, and um, but Scott kind of is, and we're, we're very stoked to have him with us tonight. So um, I'll, I'll probably just pass it over to Paul, who's got a, a, um, some, some kind of intro words, and, and we can go from there. Yeah, evening, everyone. This is kind of um, part two from what I started uh, last week around Australia in 30 days. And as I got very, very close, after I decided on that title and very, very close to um, actually putting on the show, I realised there's, there's no way I'm going to fit it in, in one show. And by far for me, the highlight and and pretty much the the grand sort of in, ending to, to my trip was was going up to the Gulf of Carpentaria with uh, Mr. Scott Portelli and that was totally his 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 baby and his idea. He reached out to me probably a couple of months before, and I was just thinking, "Oh, that sounds like a nice idea." But lockdown's going on, and I've got these other jobs on. And then I said, "Oh, what date are you thinking?" And he's like, "I was like, oh, you're kidding me? That's like a few days after I'm already in Darwin doing a job." Like, and it was like a hundred and fifty dollar flight to Cairns. So I was kind of like, "Yeah, well, that's that's not going to be too hard to slip in." So. We thought about flying there initially and um, we decided to go old school and literally drive. So uh, we'll go into the story around that. But just to just introduce Scott. Scott's a, a master of the OPP, is that correct, Scott? Yep. And he's been a professional photographer for a very long time and videographer and filmmaker and drone pilot and uh, environmentalist and, and conservationist. And he's worked all around the world um, and still does on all sorts of projects and films. Um, he won the 2016 World Sony Awards as well as BBC World Wildlife Photography of the Year, just to name two of his big gongs. Um, he's won quite a few awards for a number of his films and, and, he's really, and he does ongoing sort of scientific and climatology and environmental impact projects with different organizations around the planet as well. He runs workshops in the Arctic and Antarctic and Falkland Islands and Tonga. And he's sort of particularly renowned for his wildlife and most especially his underwater photography and film work. And that's where you may be familiar. I've come across a, a lot of Scott's work before. So, um, so it was a great opportunity for me to uh, knock heads with someone that knows a lot about a lot of things that I don't know much about, as well as um, just share a great adventure. So so we kind of winged it and no, Scott and I haven't spent much time together before. I think we've sort of maybe bumped it onto each other in the same room doing some judging or something, but it's, um, yeah, like my whole trip, I was, I was uh, couch surfing around and meeting lots of people on the way. And yeah, we, we hit up the, the Gulf of Carpentaria and that's kind of the area between Cape York and Arnhem Land, essentially. Um, there's, a, there's actually an area across that whole band on top of Australia called the Gulf of Savannah. And there's even a road called the Savannah Way. And I didn't realize that road goes to Broome. And there's a sign in Cairns that says Savannah Way to Broome. And it's like, oh, no way. And there's various sections of it. But uh, we were in the kind of northern section right on the coastal sort of edge in particular. Uh, we had a few debates about which way we're going to go there and which way we're going to go back. And we probably did the sensible decision on the way back, <laughs> especially because uh, there's a few options. It's very seasonal. It's very, it's, it's more of a two season sort of place, dry season, wet season. And Scott's actually been there in both. Um, he caught the, the late wet season earlier this year. So somewhere during the show at some stage, we, we're going to reflect on that and just how hugely different this, this area presents itself in the different seasons. It's, it's very flat. It's very open. Uh, it's some of the biggest sort of savannah, tropical grasslands in the world. Uh, there's a lot of amazing wildlife there's a lot of freaking barramundi, a lot of crazy barramundi fishermen uh, that just uh, chasing after the big one wherever you go. Uh, there's not many cars that aren't full wheel drives up there. So we, we stood out like a bit of a sore of thumb with our uh, lime green, um, juicy uh, panel van from whatever, 1980 something or other. Uh, I think we worked out it was going to cost us an extra $2,000 to hire a four wheel drive. So we decided to wing it. And my only regret from the whole trip is not filming Scott uh, trying to get this uh, get this van out of a sand trap <laughs> with sand flying everywhere. We did it. We right did it. In front of all these four-wheel <laughs> drivers, look at us going, you idiot backpackers. <laughs> and uh, yeah. we're driving in and I was like, oh, I don't know, Scott, maybe you should park here. He's like, oh, we'll be right, mate. 
we get in and I and we come back up and I was like, oh no, here we go. And people are literally like sitting down with beers, you know, just ready and, and willing to watch how this is going to go down. And we just just got out and then realized that we didn't need to do that at all. There was a road to the left of us and we went straight <laughs> to the road. And that was just purely for entertainment. But um yeah, we spent a week in the in the in the green tub. And um actually I might quickly just jump screen and just get the ball rolling on that, Scott. I haven't given you a chance yeah, to go for it off yet. But so speaking of uh, the green tub, how's how's this one looking, guys? <laughs> oh yeah, it's looking remarkably clean, really, for for the kind of roads you've been. Yeah, through. it didn't so, look like that at the end. Didn't look like that at the end. That was pretty early on, I think. And I basically slept in that roof pod the entire time, and uh, Scott slept in the the car <laughs> pretty much the whole time. <laughs> Uh, so I think we we're initially going to a hotel and we we're having a four wheel drive and I was sort of like, oh, Scotty, would you, how do you feel about camping, mate? You know? And then I was like, Oh, you know, let's, let's, I think I'd be right in just the roof. And so we ended up, uh, let's just say we put all our money into the flights rather than uh, the accommodation and, and the car, which is kind of how I roll. So I'm very grateful to Scott for um, being open to accommodate my travel style, but that's kind of how I get away with the lifestyle I do being on the road so much. I'm not as much on the road as Scott. He's looking at an average of what nine months a year normally. I think he says. Yeah, something. generally, generally in a non-COVID year, I'd probably be away from Australia for about nine months of the year, um, if not slightly more some years. Um, but yeah, this is this is COVID business has definitely put a um, <laughs> a halt on my international travel. Um, but it was good, you know this this trip aligned well. Like Paul and I were talking for a couple of months and, and Paul, you know, said it quite easily. I, I've, I've run into Paul one time, I think, judging at, you know, state awards in New South Wales. Um, and if anyone's seen Paul judge, he, he's, he's quite a um, knowledgeable, you know, well-rounded judge who could pretty much judge anything and, and quite intimidating. So, you know, when I approached him, you know, coming from a, a non-landscape background to say, hey, how about we do this project where we go up to this remote place in the middle of nowhere, hardly anyone's heard of it. Um, but, you know, do you want to do it? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we started working on the logistics, which was quite interesting because at the time, because of COVID everywhere up in uh, Queensland, up in Cairns, because that's where we left from, um, there's no cars. Every like All the hire companies sold off all their fleet. So you can't get a hire car in places like Cairns, these sort of um, big touristy areas. And we were looking at, like Paul said, like four wheel drives that were, you know, gonna be like two and a half thousand dollars for a week. And I thought, well, this is crazy. Um, what's an alternative? And we went back and forth on this a while. Then I sort of come back and said, hey, Paul, I've booked us a, uh, a juicy van. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure if Paul had seen one of these before <laughs> and he seemed excited about it before he saw it then i sent the link <laughs> um, and then yeah we managed to like in it was surprising you know in a in a week together we spent a week together but we did so much uh, i'm amazed at how much like i recall from the trip even just the drives and some of the the roads we went across um because like paul said when i was there um in the wet season which wasn't by choice because um, I wanted to come at a later time, but we were, me and my wife were finishing um, a year and a quarter long journey around Australia. And we managed to avoid uh, COVID the whole time around being stuck in South Australia, being stuck in Western Australia um, to a final point where we had to head back East. Um, and this, this was on my itinerary from the beginning of the time that I left Sydney in uh, January 2020. Um, so when I did visit up in the wet season, it was it was one of those things where I said, "This is amazing." You know, I need to sort of come back and see what it's like at a different time. So, yeah. So, like I said, everything aligned. Paul was up in that part of the world. I was planning to be in that part of the world, and yeah, we we managed to make it work. So, Scott, tell us, tell me again why why this <laughs> area in particular appeals to you, appeals to you and and also your mindset behind um you, the way you like to go back to places that at different times and different occasions like some people just hit the box and say i've done it and 
you yeah. seem to have more of an approach of I, I like to learn a place from the ground up and in, in, in a different sort of layers and, and explore it at different times a year. Yeah, um, I, I think I've t- always taken that approach, um, probably from a tour perspective. Uh, obviously, like I said, I'm, a, I'm away nine months of the year and I'm in a lot of remote places, um, Falklands, sub-Antarctic islands, you know, Antarctica, um, Azores, places like this that are, you know, you can visit and you can spend time there. Uh, but from an operational point of view, sometimes you need to get to know the area, you need to get to know the terrain, you need to get to know the politics, you need to get to know what the operator's like, who you can work with, you know, are they flexible, these sort of things. And I, and I think I take that approach with a lot of places. And I find that by going back to a place at different times of year, I, I start to get really embedded in, you know, all the possibilities. And, and there's things that you always think, you know, oh, I wish I'd done this or I should have done it a different way. But I find that um, because I do spend time in a place and, and often I'll do a recce, if I'm setting up a tour, for example, overseas, I'll spend two or three seasons, that could be three years, um, doing research on all these places to make sure when we go back and what I offer is like a premium, you know, high quality experience. So I think, you know, my, my approach to always sort of visiting places is probably twofold. One, you know, to see what's possible, what I can do in the area or, you know, see what, what happens when I get there. Cause sometimes I'll get there and, and all of a sudden, and, you know, we are creative people will come up with an idea and go, Oh, this is a great idea. Maybe I'll do that. Or maybe I'll, you know, think about what I can do um, creatively or how I can share this experience with other people. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I tend to go back to a lot of places more often than probably most people. Uh, it does mean that I tend to uh, spend a lot of time in the same places, which I guess has its you know pros and cons. Uh, but you know, there's nothing bad about going to a, an amazing, beautiful place and um, investigating you know what what is possible. I think for me, Scott, one of the appeals is actually to spend spend time with you. Like, <laughs> if I'm reflecting back on my my trip around Australia, every single place I went to, I was connecting with with the local photographers and and to me there's an opportunity to to skill share to bounce off creative ideas to look over the shoulder of another really high-end practitioner and see how they operate and you know bounce off different sort of skills like i i didn't realize quite how skilled and and a drone pilot scott was particularly for filmmaking and it was a huge part of what he does and also bouncing off ideas around you know how he makes a living and and how he makes his images available what kind of sort of networks he has out there in terms of his commercial capacity the, you know, there's, there's just, just a wonderful opportunity when you connect with a, with a, with a fellow and, and the same craft. And as Scott pointed out earlier, we, we're coming from slightly different places in terms of our, our normal genres and, and what we sort of work in. So, you know, I was watching Scott and learning quite a lot about approaching wildlife and that kind of thing. And, and, scratching scratching my head about uh how to fly how to how to get the film thing working properly with drones i think i found out today actually scott that uh those uh those drone filters they provide you just actually have to buy a stronger one or you won't yeah. be able to ever get it down to 150 and i just don't tell you that they just ship you out with that just that, that's a private one but we'll, we'll go into that later <laughs> so i think we should probably start showing some images and and uh instead of our ugly mugs um i might just quickly start Scott, with actually just a map of the area, just so people get a rough idea of where mm. we are. Um, we're going to keep it a complete secret, but you know, cat's out of the bag. What can I say? Uh, let me just whoop, try and find the old Google. Uh, look at a oh, good old. Oh, the uh, there we go, Google Maps. So you guys see that? Yep. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so basically. This whole area of water is the Gulf. Uh, to the left here, we have Arnhem Land. To the right here, we have Cape York. I guess this whole northern area all the way across the broom is, is called the Gulf of Savannah or Savannah Way. And it's full of um, tropical grassland is probably the bulk of it. There's a lot of coastal estuaries and mangroves that are on the coastal edges. Um, there's some beautiful different islands and different sort of areas. Um, as you come in now, you can kind of see kind of those mangrove areas on the coast and 
and a lot of beautiful waterways in particular. And I think that was kind of our main draw card from an aerial perspective is, is these coastal edges and, and the beautiful sort of waterways. There's, there's a large kind of areas between the floodplains a little bit further inland and the actual coastline you can see really expanding out in the open here. And some major, major rivers like the Leichhardt and, and the Mitchell that are quite prone to flooding. So when the Mitchell breaks its banks, it can push out like 40 or 50 kilometers of, of flooding in different directions. It's pretty huge. Mm. And uh, we tried a few times to find different operators to fly because that was kind of our main focus. And we there's another there's another town up on Karumba on this kind of northeast corner here. We couldn't find anyone to fly with there. There's probably operators really further south of Mount Isa. Um, so we were a little bit limited about what's out there because it's it's pretty damn remote and there's not a lot going on out there to be honest. They're not high tourist areas, particularly back down. Karumba's a little bit more set up. We kind of focused our trip around this whole area in the end. We didn't quite gun it all the way in one go. Did we, Scott? What do we? Where do we stay on the first night? We got about halfway at um, yeah, uh, Georgetown. Georgetown. There we go. Uh, which is kind of in the middle here. Just cute yeah. little town. We just found a random little um, uh, caravan park just just as we arrived, just just as they were closing. Literally the minute they were closing, so that was good timing. Um, and we gave ourselves a bit of room. Like we sort of we did gun it on the way back, and pretty much did it the whole way back in one day which from Cairns is a fair stretch. It's a good 10 hours or close to it, another gap or two. But this is a kind of our focus area. Um, there are some areas on the way that are like, um, they're kind of like uh, limestone areas, aren't they, Scott? Like there's under, underground sort of lava tubes, national parks and different sorts of things. Yeah. A few big yeah. gorges down here to the southwest and, and the Lawn Hill area in particular, which is pretty amazing. There's some really big ones. I can't remember the name, just further south. Well, if you if you if you look where Paul's pointing at the moment to the south, that's where survivors being shot. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh man, right that's the area Cl out there. Clon Curry, right there. <laughs> oh, it is Clon Curry. So, so there is. It's kind of like pretty much twenty-five to thirty degrees year round up here. There's not a lot of times where it's cooler than that, and not a lot of times where it's hotter than that. So it's quite consistent, um, and that's part of what creates the sort of ecosystem that they have up there. Uh, again, it's famous for, um, for uh, yeah, barramundi on the coast. That's kind of like what most of the people up there are pretty much barramundi fishermen. I'd probably say, what, 75, 80%? In a town uh, like I'd say Karumba, 95%. <laughs> what, what would you say? How many boats would you say per head of population in Karumba? Uh, I, two boats per person, I'd say. Per person. It's just like there's just <laughs> boats everywhere, every description you could possibly imagine. Um, just going back to uh, the town here. So the road out there is a little bit mixed. Like uh, one of the things I found interesting is it is one of the main roads across the top of Australia, but it's full of floodplain. <laughs> and uh, if this one plays for us, you get a sense of, you get the width, the road, you get the sense of how flat it is, how open it is, how dry it is, but it's actually not dry and then it's still tropical. And, you know, there's a whole season of, the wet season where everything's just flooded and, and turns as green as you can possibly imagine. In fact, one of the first things Scott said when we we're going through some areas is last time I was here, all this was completely green. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking forward to just getting a reminder of that. This was, this was home for me for the week, pretty much is uh, the pan house. So that was a, that was an ongoing joke. Very cleverly designed little pop top sort of tent that literally just rose up by itself. I actually found it brilliant and really comfortable. And, uh, it even had one thing advantage of this whole system, even though I think it cost us what $260 each or something for a week it was crazy. Yeah, and it, came with, uh, it came with gas burners and a fridge and um, all the different things you need for camping. And it had mattresses and dunas and blankets and towels. working on a sponsorship deal, Paul. <laughs> yeah, we probably should have, but we did so good out of it already that we kind of didn't need to in a way. Um, but on the way, uh, we had a few small stops at some of the towns. Um, <laughs> this is the kind of dolls they sell in the shops. Which are, so it was pretty random. Uh, this is your average kind of uh, locals or, or visiting person's T-shirt that you'll see wearing. They're, um, they're quite tied to their local bars. And that's probably the first picture I saw of a barramundi. Uh, they can get, how big can they get, Scott? They can get pretty huge. Oh, they? Yeah, they're, they're more than like a metre. Yeah, I think they get over a meter. So it yeah. really is. And, and they go quite far inland as well, up the waterways from what I can tell. Mm. Um, so the bodies aren't just on the coast. They're in a lot of the rivers um, sort of further back from it, which 
which floods sort of all the way out in different seasons. So pretty much every every shop or gas station probably has, <laughs> has uh, trophy shots of all the big Mondays. Uh, you get a bit of a sense of some of the scale and size of some of them there. And the range of characters and people that are just excited to get into it. One thing I didn't expect was the amount of boar, boar hunting shots that are up there. <laughs> Uh, that's a proud pastime as well up there. Uh, there's some pretty damn big ones and uh, a little bit messier that one, I'd, I'd, I'd suggest. But uh, definitely the other two biggest sort of pastimes that we could tell from um, people that are spending time in the area. Uh, this is one of the local girls' car. Was it said Babes, Boabs, and 4 by 4 That was uh, that was one of the locals' cars. And it was full of um, just real characters looking uh, Aboriginal women. The whole car was just full of them. And they were... They were um, Badgering some of the guys on the street and having a great old time. Um, what else we got next? So we made it to Burktown, which is, I don't know, how would you describe Burktown, Scott? Um, I guess it's a small community. Um, basically, they're probably quite heavily populated during the dry season for all the barramundi fishermen, but generally there wouldn't be more than, I don't know, maybe 100 people in town. Yeah, they have this. Um, I'll just shoot this up here. They have this really interesting feature in the middle of the town, which is kind of what it's famous for, if you could call it that. Uh, and it's actually an old bore, isn't it, Scott? It's like drew yeah. it in the eight, mid 1800s, I think. Like it's yeah. really old, and that whole create and it's boiling hot. Like literally, mm. you burn yourself silly if you get anywhere near it. And it's created all this crazy sort of algae and different sort of structures flinging around from it, and it's. Literally right in the middle of the town, but it's also a great place to catch the wildlife. Um, you know, there's usually a whole big family of spoonbills and kangaroos and, and, and wallabies. Yeah, uh, lots of wallabies, as you say. Um, God, the wallabies are quite different, actually, from Tassie, Lukey, and Nick. I noticed they're very they're very angular. They're quite sort of elegant looking. I found, and they just seem to have a, a very very refined kind of feature about them. They're, they're kind of friendly, but they're very very clear where their boundaries are. Where they They'll, they'll be in the town and I'll be present, but they won't let you get past a certain point. And it seemed very, very consistent, I found, wherever I went, wherever I saw them, that they were just happy to be present up to a point and then, then off they went. Um, so this is our, one of our first stops. Was, oh, this is our, this is our yeah, our, um, our very average attempt to an astro shot of it. Because basically to get the shot you wanted, you have to stand in the middle of a cascade of boiling water, which is not a great idea at the best of times. Uh, so we 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 reneg from that. This was one of our stops in Normantown, I think, where it was kind of our first taste of you know the leftover water from the season and the beautiful bird life, and that actually became a real feature for the trip. Uh, what what are we looking at there? Is it magpie geese there, Scott? Uh, there were some geese there. I think some ibis. Um, I'm not sure what else we saw there. Yeah, and we and a tank full of oldies, of course, right behind us. <laughs> yeah. Going on, it's very friendly ones. They gave us some oranges, so you get a lot of sort of tall groups cruising through the top of that part of the country. And I, I remember some of the I used to, I was joking a little bit. Scott's more used to it because he's literally been on the road for what a year and a half, roughly. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know what's presented to people with white hair that you come across on these in this, these parts of Australia. <laughs> the grey nomads. It's it's pretty high. I remember being in one campsite thinking, <laughs> what? I didn't find a single person with no grey hair in the whole campsite. <laughs> so it's just you're right in the middle of that sort of culture of, of, of traveling people and they're all pretty excited to be there and, and they're all very social and Scott's probably had enough of them but I, I found it quite <laughs> entertaining shall we say um, and a bit novel this was a local pub I think they had the uh, oh, one of the major footy matches on I think that night uh, yeah it might have been places, State of Oregon pretty much two places to eat in the whole town I think there's this, this one and a tiny takeaway just across the road and sometimes they're open and sometimes they're not and you don't really know their hours and the local the the uh the local um food store is like oh we're not open from like 12 to 2 or something <laughs> in the middle of the day and things like that so it's it's different country and you know there might not be petrol for 250 kilometers in any direction or diesel so and then you'll find out through the grapevine that that next station is out of diesel or it's not working so so it's kind of a different mindset being out that remote where you have to be a lot more sort of independent and a bit more thoughtful about where you go and what you got with you and what you might be facing on the way. I did a bit of wander just around around the town sort of one night. 
just it's kind of this eerie sense of space about it but it's quite beautiful and well looked after and quite loved in its in its own way um i might um stop there scott and get oh here's one more one more shot of scott on one of the um waterways so it's actually quite a good time of year to catch the wildlife because because it's starting to dry up uh, it tends to focus where the bird life in particular tends to live do you want yeah. to speak to that a bit more scott yeah yeah so in the wet season it's quite um ironic because you think there'd be mass amounts of bird life around and you know everywhere you go there's water holes and there's streams and there's estuaries um but the thing is the bird life um you know when there's an abundance of water they don't need to sort of come in land um to some of these areas so as the dry season starts to come into effect you'll see you know big flocks of birds uh coming into the waterways looking for I guess the last remaining sort of food sources, like, you know, before these areas dry up, they're, they're full of, you know, fish and small um, invertebrates and uh, crustaceans, things that these birds will forage for in the, in the waterway. So yeah, it was, it was an interesting time because when I was up there in the wet season, there were, you know, beautiful, like, you know, typical Australian birds up there, like brolgers and uh, jabaroos um, and these large, beautiful birds, but they were always, a fair way away or in the distance but um ironically on our trip we we, we saw our first brolger and we were like excited oh look there's a brolger on the side of the road and it was like you know 50 meters away from us and then as we got further and closer into these sort of town areas like Burktown and Karumba, the brolgers were like three meters on the side of the road and they weren't moving when we'd parked the van and you can almost reach out and pat them on the head from the yeah and, and and you know these are these are like you know if you you know, for all the birders out there, they, you know, they love, um, you know, these sort of beautiful encounters with, you know, such, you know, iconic creatures. And, um, and yeah, we were do, keep... do you have any, I don't know, I might be jumping the gun here, Scott, but if, if you had any pictures really yes. of any of that sort of thing. Yeah, let me. Let the poggers me... are huge. Like what's, yeah. are they hiked up to like five feet high? Like, Oh uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I think they were more than six feet. Some of these brolgers and, wow. um, Jabaroos is huge. We saw them mainly in, in sort of triptychs, didn't we? Which yeah, I would be assuming just... would be like a, a mother, father, and a, a and a baby. But it, that seemed to be the most common sort of way they presented themselves. Um, Does that come up? Yep. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. So this this is a brolga. Um, this there were often. It was funny. Like Paul and I were sort of noticing that we were seeing them in sort of groups of three. So we started sort of just making the assumption that it was parents and a, a younger chick. But these these birds are still, you know, quite impressive, um, you know, tall sort of, you know, statured birds. And one of the other ones we did see was um, a jabaroo. Oh, their colour palette is absolutely stunning. Yeah. So this is a yeah, very, very large bird, almost. But... Yeah. And the, this one was just posing perfectly for his, his, like his legs across. There's nice reflection and he decided to eat a very large fish. So but quite just lost the, the um, um, I can't see the. Yeah, yeah. I can't see either. Uh, let me try again. One second. Might be. Uh, yeah, what is that is? Oh, I don't know yeah, what happened. Right. Let's do it again. I'll do it again. Uh, they come up. There we go. Oh, yeah. oh wow. What a bird. Yeah, they're oh, just, definitely magnificent, Nick. Just, they're just beautiful. Like magnificent. look at look at that blue coloring on the neck and the you know, beautiful right. eyes and these red legs. Like, you know, you you couldn't even draw something like this and imagine it. You know, these these birds, these Australian birds are just like phenomenal, like spectacular yeah. looking. And like I said, the, this one, there was one day, and we Paul and I might talk about that a bit further, but there was one day when we were walking around in Corumba, we were just coming back from a, a morning droning session and in the distance in a bit of water, we saw some bird life. So we stopped the car, got out with our cameras and slowly walked towards the, the waterhole. And all of a sudden there, we were surrounded by um, spoonbills and cockatoos and corellas and pelicans. Um, herons and you know jabaroos and like so so many different species um of birds that we did see in this trip um it's gone blank again scott so we we did find that we, we every time we poked our head through the bush we found another little 
put a water away or a little pond and, and we were racing off to the next one. And some of the larger birds were literally, every time we went to one, they would then fly back to the one we were in before and, and they're just sort of going back and forth. So, so we, had a, we had a captive audience pretty much yeah. uh, and quite stunningly so. These guys we caught on the way through, was it, it was kind of over a, over a waterway, a bridge, wasn't it, Scott? Yeah, yeah. The, I think it was a, a dry sort of waterway, but there was a little bit of water in the stream and must have been hundreds and hundreds of corellas just sitting on the edge of the banks. Um, they were a little bit shy because as we got closer, they they tended to sort of take off and a few of them would be a little, you know, more brave, but then most of them would take off and go to the trees. But, yeah, it, we, we also probably were quite conspicuous with our big green van and our, you know... <laughs> Large, large lenses. Large lenses are walking up as tall as possible to these animals. So we weren't, we weren't too, um, too um, stealthy. Do you have a few, any of the um, eagles? So kites are everywhere up there if you hadn't been in that yeah, area. They seem to be up. I noticed that in Darwin as well. They're, they're pretty much a huge feature of pretty much everywhere you go. Um, Sorry, I'll just bring them up because... My computer's decided to be slow all of a sudden. <clears throat> Nick, you got a lot to look forward to getting up in the country like that, mate. Yeah, well, I reckon. You'll, you'll have to get used to the temperature, though, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks, uh, it looks absolutely magnificent. Um, that Jabiru is a, what a stunning bird. I, I'm sure I've seen pictures of them before, but I haven't really paid much attention. Uh, well, you reckon they're up to six foot tall? Uh, they they easily looked like when we were standing up upright and they were across from us in the water. They they definitely looked taller than us, and they were often in the water too, with you know probably about a foot or two underwater. Mm -hmm. I'm sure someone who is a bird person could probably tell us a bit more detail, but um, I, I tend to be. Oh, Scott got one. Scott actually captured one, um, catching a, a really large fish. Um, literally got the got the actual shot of it. But you can see how. How slim and long and elegant their sort of legs are. They're, they're quite an elegant sort of bird, the way they hold themselves. I only ever saw them on their own uh, on this trip, for instance, where I always saw the brolgers in a group of three. Uh, the spoonbills I always saw in a big group. So it, it was quite fascinating for me, you know, not being a twitcher, so to speak, but also learning to appreciate, you know, some of the more iconic wildlife in Australia. And you know, there's a lot of amazing artwork and dreamtime stories and different things on, on the dance and the brolgers, for instance. And, to be able to see them, like literally, just almost like reach out and touch the head. Like, yeah. I don't know why. I still can't understand why you literally just pull over in a car and then just be standing there, just nonchalantly, like nothing in the world. And it only really happened in a, as we got further north and particularly further up to Karumba. So I don't know if there's a, there's a Brolga whisper in uh, Karumba that's <laughs> working on everything. Yeah. You have to, um, I'm assuming, you have to be careful of where you go in regards to crocodiles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I guess especially when there's less water around, so where the waterways are, um, there's a lot of um, croc warnings and even the locals will sort of make sure you sort of don't go in the wrong area. Mm. Um, but it's funny too because I guess anyone who's ever, you know, spent any time um, looking, you know, for crocs and stuff, um, they're never easy to find. Like <laughs> you can never see them, which means that, like even though they're there all the time, um, you know that's how stealthy they are and how easy um, they can get you. Oh, you've got yes. sorry, a couple of photos. This is, a, yeah. this is a, your classic kind of kite. Uh, they seem to be a really big part of the ecosystem up there. I guess the, you know, it, it's sort of deceptively not barren looking, but dry looking when I was there, and yet the underlying structures has so much water going through it in the different seasons that there's a lot of life and there's a lot of marsupial life and a lot of mouses and different things that they can hunt. And it's probably a very, very rich place for them to be because pretty much everywhere we went, there was quite a large amount of them. And obviously you don't get large amounts of wildlife unless there's large amounts of food source. Um, so they were, they were constant companions. Uh, this one, we actually got to watch a bit of a mating ritual, literally right there and then. <laughs> um, we literally one came along and we sort of heard a bit of a noise, what's going on. And, and we got treated to... Um, a live display of kite coupling, which was uh, kind of beautiful in its own way. And uh, we kept telling it where to turn so we'd get the catch light in its eye and it finally heard me in the end. 
<laughs> uh, I borrowed one of Scott's lens, thankfully. Um, this is Spoonbill. Spoonbill, yeah. Yeah, I haven't been through my wildlife stuff stuff yet. I literally just picked out four shots, I think. Um, yeah, such a treat. I remember I sort of got more of a sense of the idea of how patients can pay off because I remember kind of trying to get this Yabaru in particular close enough to get a shot and let alone when it was flying. And it literally, as we went near it, it would, it would creep away and then fly off to the next um, pool. And then I decided, you know what, I'm just going to sit still under this tree. And literally five minutes later, it just flew back and just flew right in front of my face, like spread wing. And I was like, you've got to be joking. And I was there prepared, ready to go with all the right settings. And I had a bit of fun with my R5, trying to um, use the tracking. And it did a brilliant job. So, you know, and you can shoot, you know, for 20 grams a second if you want to. So, uh, so it was nice to kind of test out my equipment a little bit more as well. Like, you know, as part of my professional development aspect of the trip, I guess. Um, learning more how to read wildlife, how to approach them, what direction to come from, what light, you know, how the behaviors work. Um, whether they do collectively, getting more of a sense of the seasons, what their food sources are, how they interact with other species. It's, it's kind of a long ongoing process to build up your knowledge, I think, well enough that you can get consistent kind of photographs. And then obviously it's location-based um, as well as season, of course, where to go. These guys are pretty friendly. That was white heron, I think. Uh, yeah, that's a heron. Yeah, we did pretty well with him too at some stage. So, um, yeah, Scott, you were using a effectively like a 500, 560? Yeah, I'll, 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 pull up, I'll pull up a shot if you want. Um, one, two. I'll stop sharing. Uh, one, two. Um, yeah, so I, I was, I had a couple of rigs with me. Um, oh, there we go. This is a wedge tail. Does that come up? Yeah. Yeah, maybe go full screen so we can see it a bit. Yeah. Better. Doesn't want to come on. Go full screen. Yeah, that was a massive one from memory. Um, I'll do F for full screen. Yeah, it's not. Like it. Right. Yeah, your computer needs a needs a holiday, mate. I don't know. It's bizarre. Well, it's not as bizarre as me starting my talk last week and then the internet going down. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my show, and I was going live, and uh, I literally oh, yeah. had to restart the entire computer to even have a show. So uh, yeah, it was a spare yeah. in the works. So that one. <laughs> this was a this was a wedge tail we saw, and. It's got something in its its talons. Um, it looks like a rabbit, maybe. Yeah, either that or it's maybe some roadkill. Um, yeah, it was an it's interesting so strong. Version, that one. And then we've got the. Oh, this is the. Oops. Oh, the jabber in flight. Oh, that's a jabber in wow. flight. Yeah. Oh, you can oh, see. Sure. You can see, like, these birds are massive, like, you know, massive wingspan. It must be at least, like, a two-and-a-half, maybe three-metre wingspan. Um, That's incredible. And to sort of take off is a bit of effort. Um, so, yeah, just a spectacular-looking bird. Like, the more the more we saw it, the more we sort of just um, wanted to hang around. Now, it's got, you can't quite see there, but it's got a certain quite interesting eye colour too, isn't it, Scott? Yeah, I'm going to bring, bring it up. Yeah, the bright yellow. One. So that combination of that almost like opulescent dark teal blue with, with teal green blue with the... Yeah, just, the, just the colours. Like, you can imagine if you, yellow could, eyes. if you could get close and get some really fine detail on the feathers, um, you'd probably see like a range of different colours. Um, but, yeah, just, just the fact that we saw it was catching a fish, and that's a fairly decent-sized fish. I, I wouldn't have even thought there would have been a fish that big in this little body of water, uh, which was quite... Well, it was kind of strange. Like, it's like it's pretty good size, and it was not a big body of water, and it was kind of an isolated... It wasn't like a creek-fed one. It was literally quite an isolated one. Uh, and there were a lot of pelicans in there. Oh. Yeah, they were, they were extremely so And the, When we first got there, they were... They were actually in massive groups. They were working together and um, diving down, like putting their heads underwater all at the same time together to feed. Um, we weren't close enough to capture the action, but you could see that it must have been more than 50 of these pelicans um, putting their heads down in the water every few seconds to um, find 
I guess some little fish. These are the herons, the, uh, the white herons we saw. Beautiful birds. Yeah, I found those two. It was a lovely dance photographically in terms of the way they interrelated with each other and kind of working on the different shapes and angles in terms of when they were facing each other or away or the next crossing over and then playing around with reflections. They were, they were a great subject. I probably spent about 25 minutes just sitting with those two. Yeah. I'll just come out of that. There we go. Yeah, so, so yeah, the bird life was um, phenomenal this time of year. Like, um, you know, it, you know, we just touched the surface of what we saw because it wasn't our pure focus while we were there, but um, we did we did come across a lot of wildlife. And like we said, there were a lot of uh, different types of kangaroos. Um, and, you know, there are lots, lots of animals around. Like it, we, we didn't have an opportunity to spend too much time out on the water, which is a shame, but mm. next time. Uh, but if, I think if we would have went down the estuaries in a small boat, um, we would have seen a lot more bird life, a lot more crocs, you know, a lot more life going on in these, these waterways. These waterways are just quite, fascinating and unique like and you'll see when we start showing the aerial photos how how different and diverse the landscape is and um the surrounding areas we did see a lot of cricket <laughs> yes we did a lot of crickets. there's like highways of flying crickets and these crickets were like this big like they're uh, yeah, massive. Bigger, I'd, like they they're were literally massive. just like bang into you and just you just had to get used to the fact that at any time you could just get smacked in the head or yeah. find one on your shoulder or get a clip in the back or however it was. So we, we're going to have a, a very um, a very short interlude exploring the world of the crickets. So uh, get your cup of tea ready, maybe a whiskey, and, and check out our, our corridor of crickets. Ah, oh, glorious, glorious. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> full, full credit to uh, Scott's uh, editing skills and, and visionary um, <laughs> filmmaking there with the old iPhone. It was, it was quite interesting too because I figured I, I, hadn't, I didn't really know Paul Holan too well and I thought, what, am I stretching the friendship if I ask him to run through a whole bunch of grasshoppers? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he climbed a fence, seemed to be into it, and I've said, "Yep, let's let's do that." So, yeah, we definitely we were definitely on the same page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, uh, yeah, we we got on really well. It was a brilliant trip. We really enjoyed the company, and um, I think uh, I think one of my favorite parts. We actually spent I don't know how many hours in this in this one camp kitchen. Well, I think we took it over for about eight hours a day, and that was kind of like weird when somebody else actually came in and we. Because we'd do our aerial shoots and or drone shoots first thing in the morning and, and last thing at night and and then we pretty much have downtime during the day, you know. And in between we did some of the wildlife work and and so it's pretty much sort of editing time and reflecting time and you know, bouncing off what each other's doing and a little bit of skill sharing on different things and, and we swapped a lot of our, our images and video with each other. It was it was yeah, it was a really, really enjoyable time actually. And having just shot you know 15 hours and we just think Corey even turned up i had a, had a little bit of backlog to go through uh 
say, yeah, I think there was a lot of bad television going on as well. A few, a few ninja, what's that ninja show? That was up there a bit. Oh, uh, Ninja Warrior. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, of course, watching the freaking COVID cascade come out. Because oh, I yeah. literally left Perth and Perth went into lockdown. I left Darwin and Darwin went into lockdown after I left. And then I was sort of trying to figure out, because my next step was actually to try and head home. And literally the morning... The morning we got back was was when my flight was to head back to Tassie. So, so we were both sort of thinking, oh, are we going to be able to go home? Or that was kind of on the back of my mind. And at the same time, we were really happy to sort of be where we were. <laughs> in the meantime, because it's pretty remote and not too likely much is going to go on out there. Um, it was a bit of a fast stretch to the big reach. So it was a good place to be and also a good place to wait it out. And we both even discussed the idea of waiting out and doing some other another trip or aspirin trip for another week or two if we couldn't get back um there's plenty of scope and plenty of areas that could keep going and uh but uh yeah we ended up um pulling it off and, and heading back to the wind you so scott i might start talking about some of the aerial stuff because that's probably the, yeah, the highlight the reason why we're there i'll um i'll jump onto my screen here again and and start giving people a bit of a sense of what we're getting up to so the good old grasshoppers had to happen, had to happen. So we spent most of our time in, in the same plane. And this is it here. It's a 182 Cessna. Um, you'll notice that the planes around it are all low wings. So it's actually was really not a lot of options up in that part of the world, um, to put it lightly. And uh, Scott had flown with them before, so he kind of knew them and and sort of teed the whole thing up ahead of time. So it was a little bit lucky for me. I just kind of walked in on this trip in a lot of ways, apart from helping choose our, uh, <laughs> our accommodation style and, uh, and car choice. But um, yeah, it's quite a versatile sort of plane. They were quite happy for us to have the door off. And we literally just shared, you know, one person in the front and one person in the back. And you still have the wing and the wheel strut. Um, and it was quite different sort of the kind of shots you got depending on we sat so I, I really enjoyed having my mirrorless camera for this and being able to shoot really really low and pop the camera sort of out the window or, or flip the screen out and shoot behind or and not be locked into having to have my eye on the viewfinder the whole time and I found that that gave me a lot more versatility in, in terms of the angles and making the most of the tricks you do have that issue don't you Scott of like having to time your shots or, or wait till the shot you wanted was out of the way of the wing of the wheel strut. Yeah. But, um, and it, like you don't have a big gap between the, the strut and the wheel. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we, we actually surprisingly made it work well, um, which is good. And I think, you know, we took a lot of learnings from what we were doing after the, you know, first couple of flights. And I think knowing that playing and obviously a pilot, you know, that pilot at the time, we'd probably, you know, maybe ask to do a few things differently, but, yeah, I think I think it was a definitely a workable plane. Yeah, you know, I found um, I found it quite comfortable by the end and and quite versatile. And of course, you know, it's a really cost effective way to do aerial photography. Probably, probably the most cost effective way to do it. Really, uh, choppers probably double, if not triple, the cost. And then, of course, by sharing it, you're halving the cost as well. So, so we just tag teamed it a bit for the front of the back. Um, I think we did uh, three flights in the end uh, up there. And, you know, we're doing our research. We're looking at the wind every day, thinking about the angles. Do we go on a morning flight? Do we go on an evening flight? What are the tides doing? You know, what are the cloud structures going to be doing? Uh, what direction do we want to fly in first? Um, you know, what, what kind of structures do we want to make sure we catch? How far do we want to stretch? How far our flights can go, given, given the time factor, the cost factor, and, you know, the capacity of the plane itself. Um, getting to know the pilot, you know, learning how to communicate. L literally, there was a couple of flights, I think you, you'll see in one of the videos, um, that I didn't even have any communication with the pilot at all other than screaming through the air. I didn't even have a headset. So so <laughs> sometimes when you go to the, the, the uh, Outback places, and particularly a lot of the old Cessnas, the, you, it's a bit hit and miss, the kind of uh, communications you, you've got working in the plane. Um, but we totally made it work. And, and you know, we, we kind of always knew it was going to be a little bit like that. Um, that's kind of the front edge of the plane. Two good looking dudes there. <laughs> right, at, right at the end of our last flight, we've got a shot. Uh, so here's Scott sort of working with the pilot to get that sense of range and where we want to go from because you want to be fairly efficient. And you can see we're using multiple devices there. So 
pilots often have their iPads and, and they're what they use for their tracking their flights and you know, the GPS orientated and they have all the flight restrictions and height restrictions in different places. And, but the phone's actually really good for giving those satellite image pictures and giving the physical structure and the colors and, and the kind of more visually, um, visually clarifying the kind of features we want to go for. And then it takes a little while, I think, for a pilot to understand the kind of angle you want to shoot it from. Do you want to shoot top down? Do you want to shoot oblique? Do you want to be close to it? Do you want to be right over the top? Do you want to be, you know, on the ocean side or which side? And and because we're only shooting out of one side of the plane, we have to be quite conscious of that as well in terms of planning and in terms of, you know, making sure we can get to where we want. And then the wind is quite a big factor in that you might be in the perfect spot, but then literally the wind's just blowing you away from the shot that you want. So it's 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 kind of an art and a science at the same time. So getting the kind of images that you really, really want. Um, it's like a cool black and white version of the same thing. Uh, so looking happy there. I think this is how we... <laughs> I think I, no, I was on the front of the first flight, I think. Yeah, you were, in the, front, the, you were was, in the front when we did the morning flight. Yeah, that first... Um, so it was beautiful. That light, that day was amazing. Oh, my God. It was a stunner. So yeah. putting a room in the back. So I've got all Scott's kind of extra bits and pieces over here. And, you know, and then, you know, bath bags <laughs> if needed and... I think I had my um, Osmo there for doing some sort of stabilized video. Uh, I was mainly, I used my R5 pretty much the whole time. I had a 5DSR as well uh, as a backup. And I've actually switched a bit. I love that 24105RF lens so much with its eight stops of image stabilization and the flexibility of the compositions that I pretty much had it on the camera most of the time. I haven't done that for five years. I've only been using fixed focal length lenses. Uh, because of the better optics and the better in the low light performance. But I just, you lose something when you don't have the flexibility compositionally. And I actually miss a lot of shots or I have to crop in later, for instance, and lose a lot of the real estate as it were in terms of doing large prints. So it's, it's, so it's still pretty good and pretty sharp and sharp enough, particularly when you got software like, you know, Pope sharpening things like that out there. So I took the hit on that and, and I was really, really happy and comfortable with, with pretty much most of the results that I got. Scott, what were, what were you using mainly? Yeah, I, I was using, I've got the new Olympus uh, 1X um, and I'd say most of the time I was using a, a 12 to 100 lens and it's on a, a 4.3 sensor. So I, I guess that is close to equivalent to like a you know, 24 to 105, something like that. Um, or a bit more, sorry, one, 150, 160. Um, it, it, was a, it was a great lens. Like it, it just gives me that ability to, you know, when we're a bit lower down to, you know, stay wide and when we're higher up to zoom in. Um, I'd sometimes switch between that lens and uh, Olympus have a, another pro lens, a 40 to 150, which is actually a great lens for like getting that detail. Um, and I think I also had around my neck, the, my Canon 1, 1DX Mark II, um, and I was shooting the whole time 85mm uh, prime with that uh, with the Canon, uh, which was good. It was actually good to see the different results and, you know, the like the new 1, 1X, uh, the Olympus 1X um, mirrorless is, yeah, it's a fantastic mirrorless camera. Um, you know, it, it pretty much achieved... You know everything I needed to achieve with it and the lenses, so it was. Yeah, I think I I use that most of the time anyway while I was up in the air. Yeah, it was. I mean, one of the interesting parts of you know sharing flights is is getting a sense of what you're drawn to, what you're not drawn to. This is a the, is a rough idea of a, of a quick sort of flight plan. That's that's kind of literally straight off a pilot's um, a pilot's iPad, so you can see kind of altitude distances and some of the different lots, kind of lots of circles. Lots of circles and lots of squircles. <laughs> See, when we, we hit something we like, we start um, circling around it. And that's pretty much how you get the top-down angle and you get to explore a certain bit of subject matter from a different kind of angles. And, and you'll see in our images shortly just how massive a difference it can make in the kind of angle that you're photographing the same subject from and also the time of day. Scott, do you want to maybe pull up that video and see if we can get that Yeah, point? yep. Um, Scott um, is as being a filmmaker. He's always thinking those sort of angles, and he set up the plane quite well with um, GoPros and uh, at, at various times during the flights. We couldn't quite get him to let us uh, put him on the wing, but we did try every time. 
Scott says he tries with every pilot that he uh, goes out with. But <laughs> yeah. What's your hit rate? 20% or something? Well, you know what? Hel- heli-, heli pilots seem to be a bit more open to me throwing GoPros all over their, the outside of their rigs. But playing pilots, I've had one or two that'll let me, but, you know, where where you want to put it and where they let you put it is always a different thing. <laughs> Maybe you could put a GoPro on a uh, rotor of a helicopter. Oh, yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I'll show you. I'll show you sometime some footage from Antarctica. <laughs> oh my God, Scott, show me some of his. his yeah. But in in the meantime, here's a here's a quick snippet to sort of give you an idea of the terrain and the landscape we go across in our basic, um, regular routine, our daily routine. It's, it's gonna go slow for me for a second. Yeah, Plan B is all. I've only got it on YouTube, so. Should start. I've got it on like the main hard drive. Let me just open it again. Maybe that's the way to do it. There it is. Sorry, guys. It's I don't know why it's going so slow, but. You're not sharing your screen, mate. Yeah, I'm just getting the video up first. Sorry. I've got it ready to go on Facebook if, if it doesn't work on your end. Yeah, I'll give, give it one more second. Here we go. All right, I'm going to share screen one sec. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to put that edit together too, Scott. Really appreciate it. No worries. All right. At least I know it's working now, so that's good. Uh, share screen. Uh, share. And... See that? Yep, there we go. Fantastic. Beautiful edit, Scott. Thank you for that, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I, if you if you sort of sit with that for a little while, there's quite a lot of elements that come through with a video like that. Is one the characteristics of the landscape for starters and the variation of color, um, the kind of structures you're going to come across, and you'll see the quite different uh, color palettes relative to the time of day. Um, you'll see that there was pockets of water and sort of reflective elements. Um, there was a really big kind of mangrove structures. There was the, the kind of, um, what color would you describe those, the edges of, of, of the waterways on the coast with the sand patterns? It's kind of like a Yeah, mode. they they were bizarre. It was, it was fully, like a, I felt, I felt like it was just watercolors just um, blending in. You know, if someone had a paint palette, they'd, all their watercolors just blending in from, you know, different color points. It was beautiful. You can kind of see also, you know, the, the GoPro was actually situated similarly to the viewpoint that we had. So trying to shoot between the, the wing and the wheel strap. But um, 
you know, if you've got a lens that, that can zoom beyond like 50 mil, it's very easy to shoot through the gaps. Uh, with a wider lens than that, you might have a bit of trouble depending on what direction you're going in, uh, which is, again, why the versatility of a zoom sort of comes in. Or, you know, I've shot a lot of those planes because um, they're the most uh, cost effective. Uh, there are other models you can get, like a 210, which actually, a Cessna 210, which have no wing or wheel strut at all. Uh, but they're a bit harder to come across and, and they're a bit more, quite a, often quite a bit more expensive to fly in. Uh, but it's sort of it's you, you get used to it, really, don't you, Scott? Yeah, like like I said, I think I think it's workable, and and you know, it's sometimes beggars can't be choosers. There there was no other option for probably a thousand kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Scott, do you want, are you I I first starting to show some of your yeah. um, some of your images? So yeah, sure, sure. Um, and we can talk a little bit about you know what time of day or or what drew you to those things. Yeah, cool, cool. Focal length um, you might have been shooting it at. So Scott shot often quite a bit longer than I did on this trip, uh, I think, because yeah. I, I, I fell back on my wider lens. I'm blaming Luke for this. It's, uh, I never used to shoot wide, oblique photographs from the air, but he's, he's, he's corrupting me to go back to that. And so I didn't want to lose the flexibility of being able to do that. And normally I'm swapping between two cameras, 35, 85, and I'm losing shots during that time that I'm swapping over as well. Uh, as well as losing the flexibility of the composition. So I'm, I'm sort of leaning back in a different direction. Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm, I should have checked before. I think I shot this on the 12 to 100, the Olympus um, Pro Lens 12 to 100. Um, we, we did go around this feature quite a bit, and you'll probably see um, in a lot of Paul's shots and my shots that we've almost covered this from so many different angles, but it, it just changed so dramatically. And every time we looked at it, something revealed itself, like an, an eye, a face, a mouth, um, you know, that abstract sort of structures that you kept looking into were, were quite fascinating. And then you had this colour palette of this, this, these runny sort of yellows and greens and, you know, the mud and sand flats sort of blending in uh, through these colours. And, you know, in a lot of the places that we shot a lot of these uh, landscape features, there was, there was life. There was, you know, there was bird life on the edge of a peninsula or, you know, in the waterways. Um, can you zoom into the middle of that shot, Scott? Or I'm not sure. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can zoom in. So if you hadn't noticed already, there's a very, very large, like a multiple species of birds there. Yeah, you? I'd say you've got probably pelicans and I'd say maybe some sort of geese or ducks or something down there. But these are definitely pelicans, the ones in the water. Um, but yeah, there, were, there was quite a lot of interesting life in there. Um, Depending on you, the composition you, you shot, like uh, at a longer composition, they were sitting sort of right at the peak edge. So it's yeah. nice to have those little reveals and obviously the beautiful textures and, and the rippling of the water as well. As well as yeah, that, and I, I guess the remnants, of, the remnants of the water sort of on the, the landscape itself, like the, the little sort of you know, hints of colour, you know, that make it look like an eye and mouth. This one always reminds me of aliens. <laughs> yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, yeah, actually, Scott was talking about that, you know, that ex, the actual aliens film with the extendable kind of mouth that comes in, like... Yeah, that's all we needed in there. <laughs> and certain angles, it also kind of almost looked like a, um, a lizard of some kind as well. Yeah, well, like, like I said, it was one of those ones we shot at so many different angles. Let me see. This was gone uh, to grey, Scott. I think there's okay. Let, after there's a probably, period of time, as someone that creeps in and 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 grays out your screen. Not yeah. Sure okay. Oops. Yeah. For some reason, the, I think the program I in jumps me out of it every time I open a new one. But that's okay. We're back. Oh wow! Oh, I haven't seen that one. Jeez. Well, this one. You know what I think this is, Paul. This is when we went out the the second day where the tide wasn't. Um, oh. and I think that's when we started to see those colors and those bits of, of water and sand sort of blending into each other. So I think this was the day we went out in the afternoon. Um, mm. tide wasn't as low. That's it was quite one interesting. I think of the trip, Scott, like it, it almost oh. looks like a, you know, like a mountain range on the left-hand side, you know, like falling down into the center of the frame into like a, a plateau of some kind. It's, yeah, it, it, it was, it, it's definitely a, a fascinating sort of um, 
it's got a flow to it. I, I really love the flow in this. The more I, the more I look at it, I'm, I'm watching the flow between, you know, between all the elements and the edges and the, the waterways and the, the colors. Like, like you said, it, it's just got that sort of cascading flow um, all throughout the image. So, it, yeah, it was, for me, this was an interesting shot. And then you've obviously got, I remember it was a little bit windy that day. So I guess that's why we're getting the ripples in the water itself. Yeah, it was one of those things like, when do we go? What's the wind going to be doing? And often it was actually less wind in the afternoon, which is not particularly common, actually. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was the other way around. And I think it was interesting, too, because the I think the day we, the first day we went out, it was afternoon. And then the second day we went, it was the morning. And yep. the, that day we went in the morning, the light, I think we both agreed that if we did, you know, we had more time and more time to be up in the air, we'd probably um, choose mornings over afternoons, um, which, yeah, which was quite interesting, the way the light was hitting the landscape, which I guess we'll have a look at. Oh, it's done it again. Let me find one. Um, yeah, I'll never forget those morning shots from that second morning, Scott. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, oh, even just the, I guess, the, the patterns and the structures, like... Uh, Sorry, it keeps jumping in and out. Just like I said, it seems to be this program. Mm. Um, but yeah, like even just the layers, um, the layers of, you know, different, like you've got salt plains, mud flats, probably some other sort of earth structures and, you know, just the, the colours and the layers in a lot of these areas we flew over, but just quite different, like the, the coastline, the sort of mud plains, the, the areas where there's estuaries and waterways. Um, they were they were quite like every everywhere we went had such a a different range like and and Paul's probably got a lot more experience in these than me but a lot of places that you do go to you you tend to find that there are a lot of similar features but I, I found here or I find here that it can be quite different in just short um, areas like apart from each other. Mm. Yeah, it sort of surprised me the the variation you could find in a very very short distance of, of color palette and texture and, and layering. You know, there's those really obvious physical structures of the beautiful fractal waterways, but even then, the variety amongst them is like nothing I've ever seen sort of anywhere. Mm. Yeah, and you know, sometimes there'd be a, a larger waterway. Um, in, in an area that you wouldn't expect, we'd go over the top of them and go, oh, wow, there's there's a waterway, water system there. Um, and even just, yeah, the, the layers and textures and the, the colour palette sort of leading us into a lot of the places that we sort of chose to spend a bit more time flying around. Um, it was quite interesting. Yeah, it was a really striking blue, that particular feature, wasn't it? Just almost like a rich royal blue. I just wanted to scream out at you. Yeah. Got that grey screen again, Scott. Okay. Uh, don't know why it wants to do that, but we'll get past it. Build up the anticipation each time, mate. Yeah, every time I open it, you see my face in between. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely balance to this one. So this is exciting for me, guys, because I haven't seen most of these. And that's, be, you know, that's having, because I wasn't. That's because I wasn't as efficient as Paul. <laughs> he'd every night he'd had a whole bunch of detail, and I was still going. Geez, I took three thousand photos today. What am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, I was so excited from the shoot. I I start up every night till twelve or one, just just going. Oh my god! Oh my god! Where's the next one? Uh, I couldn't help myself. But I think the interesting thing too was when we did shoot at different times, like. Yeah, that that gold. There's there's so much gold in these um, in a lot of our upper gold, man. Upper gold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely gold in the landscape. Like a lot of a lot of the elements, and um, you've probably seen some of Paul's photos already. Even even the one um, for the promo. You know, just that beautiful, vibrant yellows and golds that, that you get through um, this landscape, isn't it? Quite interesting. Well, I think you can see by the very, very subtle amount of light that giving the dimensionality to those features down the bottom. Oops, mm. dropped out again, Scott. But uh, that combination of gold and blue in particular just was really 
um, one of the more striking aspects, I think, of that landscape. And a lot of my favourite images were kind of across that sort of visual bandwidth, shall we say? Oh, yum. But yeah, like even this, this I think it was that morning we shot and even just the angles, some of the angles we're on, like, you know, this looks very metallic to me. Yeah. You know, there's some beautiful aquas in the water and, you know, a bit of blue up in the, the corner. But that metallic looking, like, it would be interesting to how I would print this shot. And, you know, even though it's, you know, got that very typical beautiful tree structure to it that we see in a lot of aerial shots, I think the the what really appeals to me is, yeah, this just, you know, interesting like texture and reflection i'm getting um so yeah i find this quite another i, I was just thinking out loud scott how you could get maybe six or seven different photographs that would suit very different paper types circling around this one feature shooting mm. it at different angles of light like i remember that quite well and, and remember that there's actually quite a rich sort of aqua green blue coloration of the waterways and the mm. little more hints of color through the areas that are quite highly reflective at the moment. And it's a totally different image, just 90 degrees to the right. Um, yeah. with a totally different color palette and, and, you know, obviously and different kind of structural and spatial kind of features, depending on what angle you're coming from as well. Just going Greg and Scott. Yeah. <laughs> Grey master. Hey. That's my... Um, well, I love the balance of the, the one before <laughs> too, Scott, the way you've got the smaller features at the bottom and, and that big open space and layering at the top. Yeah, this yeah, is a funny one to figure out how to shoot, wasn't it, Scott? I know. We, we went around this. This is quite interesting too because um, we went around this feature a number of times and, and you know, from a very um, obvious point of view, we had a, a lot of elements that look like waves or, you know, a lot of movement and a sort of round sort of uh, shapes to this shot. And this one's obviously a lot tighter than probably some of the other ones we both took, but um, I really did like the movement in this area. It's just, it was a really tricky one to shoot and sort of go, okay, am I doing it justice? I felt, I felt like I wasn't doing it justice, but it, it was one of these um, elements that was, it also just was another element that you just go, this is so different than what we've been shooting five minutes ago. Mm. Yeah, you'll see you'll see some of mine from a little bit further back of that feature too. Um, okay. Greg and Scott. Uh, uh, oh, I guess we've got this. Might as well show the blue structure. Oh. Probably to go out and anything like you normally do, Scott. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, this is one of those elements, and like I said, it, it's a very typical sort of shot. But it's also, you know, it's oh, one I don't of think so at it, all. yeah, thanks. It's one of those shots I also look at, and then I go, oh, if I went back, I can see some other elements that I probably missed, you know, when I was up in the air. Um, but I do, I do like. Can, can you talk me through that, Scott? What you're thinking, what you do differently with this? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think the thing about this structure, and we, we did go around it a few times. But I, I think it wasn't until I got it back on the computer, I started to see that there was multiple layers, there was multiple sort of patterns and structures just outside the edges. Like, you know, the dominant feature here is this blue lake in the middle. But when you look to the edges of the photograph, you start to see how much like difference there is in the, the patterns, the colours, the textures, the you know, the estuaries coming in and out. I, 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 I could see this as could be quite abstract if I probably didn't include too much of the um, water itself. Um, like I said, it's, it's, you know, to me, it's still a beautiful uh, representation of what it was like there. Uh, but I, I've, I feel that there's something more that it could be. Yeah, I, I think I like it more than mine. Uh, <laughs> Where, where I was working on some isolating some of those features a little bit more. Um, it, it sort of looked, I love how it kind of felt like there was almost like this, this royal blue hole in the middle, you know, you could just fall into or, or it almost looked kind of raised up structurally to, to, to hold, um, hold a bit of elevation with it, where that point is. It's almost like an entry point to somewhere else. Mm. Oh, wow. 
I think this this was interesting too because I guess like we all see different things in our photos and when I looked at this one I thought oh does this look like the trunk of an elephant? <laughs> um, sure. but it was it was that part of that landscape I think where we went up to where the mangroves hit when we went towards the the north. Um, now I'm, I'm possibly you've got similar sort of shots and stuff, but yeah, I, I really did like the way this sort of fell into place when I looked at it. I thought, yeah, to me, it's like the trunk of an elephant or, you know, a joint and, and it's probably a shot that we took a bit higher up maybe. Um, but yeah, I, I sort of enjoy looking at this shot. I'm not sure what it is about it. Yeah, it's 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 a face to me all the way. Yeah, um, I'll I'll pull one more up and then I'll let you jump in, Paul. Sure. Um, let me have a look. Uh, where are we? Oh, this one. Interesting. I think. I think I like this one a little bit. It's, it reminds me of, you know, like it's one of those Sistine Chapel moments where, you know, the hands are reaching out to each other, um, you know, the hand of God. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I guess that's my perception of, you know, what it looked like or how I saw it. Um, but, it, yeah, I feel it's just got those fingers or those hands just sort of linking up, um, you know, around it. Um, but like I said, you know, that's just, you know, what I, what I see. But, um yeah, it's it's a bit more simplistic and more subtle, but um, it is a an interesting way to sort of represent <clears throat> one part of the waterway. I think I really enjoy that. There's a lot of entry points to this image, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of a lot of dynamism through the different sort of diagonal kind of nature angles of different things. It, there's textural things to play around. You can go right and look at the different details of mini branches and. There's almost that sheath of that grey around around the, um, the nerve structure of the central piece. It's, yeah. I think it's one of those images I feel I can really easily spend quite a lot of time with and really enjoy. It's yeah, I, I think so too. Mm. And, yeah, I nothing like anything I've got. So that's been quite interesting yep. for me. Well, I'm, I'm glad I went before you because going after you would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I've, I've hardly – I've just run a very fast brush truck over most of mine. I've hardly um, – had a chance to edit anything, but some of them are even raw. But um, but I'll, I'll have a play around. I've, I've got a bit going on here. Um, this one coming up, alright, everyone? Yep. <coughs> yeah, I think this this was shot on the first night. I think, and to be honest, apart from that golden morning, it was my favourite light. It has this really stunning magenta hue to it, and it's still lit with a sort of hint of gold, and it just sort of lit up everything just so magnificently felt very very um yeah really lucky and grateful to, to get that kind of quality of light i guess and there was still enough side lighting to give things a bit of structure and a bit of spatial sort of depth as well and here you've just got a phenomenal amount of detail to sort of explore you know from the tiny little white edges and you know the different kind of styles and types of vegetation as well as the obvious main rib structure and yeah, I don't know how else to put it into words, sort of what I like about this, but it's, yeah, it's the first one I think I posted for the trip and because um, I was just really excited that I got one straight away that I really like. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's for Luki. That's, that's my oblique shot, right? Uh, this gives you a sense. This is a little bit further inland. This is probably 20 k's inland from the coast maybe. And oh, do you remember what river system that was, Scott? Um, this, the bigger one was the Leichhardt. Yeah, this was oh, the one we were on. Sorry. This is where the boat ramp is. Yeah. So yeah. This, yeah. This is the boat ramp where people this launch. Is the Albert. It's literally a boat ramp just, um, just down here. You can see one of the, one of the else is. So, so it's a little bit out of town. This is all, I think largely, um, just off to the right here is kind of Aboriginal managed land too, with a few signs in different places. Yeah. That's quite typical for that, that snaking kind of structure of the rivers and the beautiful sort of mangroves and, different styles of sort of vegetation. So, you know, from the ground, you just wouldn't even know that it's like that at all. Um, and we watched quite a few of the fishermen coming back with smiles on their faces at different times. So here's moving a little bit further out to the coast, a little bit sort of moodier kind of light, you know, sort of emphasizing, 
I guess the textural component quite a lot. I probably probably did a little touch on the clarity slider, maybe just to emphasize that's almost like fine hair features on the sand as as well as the kind of angled almost like interplay of the different kind of energies and structures and movements that you get when, when, you know, like you throw a pebble on the ground or the way water sort of wraps around subject matter, kind of similar to how sound has to do the same thing. Just something I like to, to overlay a little bit in my mind. Yeah, I was about to say, it looked a bit like sound vibrations coming up from the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see that at first, Nick, but then I just while I was talking to myself, I just reflected on that. Yeah. This feature on the top was just like, I couldn't get enough. It was like a dragon head. And <laughs> and the area to the right was just like a skeleton or a vertebrae or, or bone. Yeah. And, and there was so many different ways you could interpret this compositionally as we were flying around. And some of them were isolated, the head features. Some of them were focused on the kind of sort of bone-like structure. And, and actually that first shot that Scott took with the birds, you can actually just see the hint of the white, white mm -hmm. birds sort of right there on the end. Um, but I'll get to some shots that sort of cover that up. So again, you know, you change your angle and you start getting this reflective capacity on the sand that gave it a very, very different, almost like a silvery steel-like palette to it. That was sort of almost looking back the other way as you went past. And, you know, there's areas that would, you know, give you smooth water that were more sheltered from the ripples and and the birds are literally just, just, just down, on, down off the screen to the left there. This is my uh, my dragon head structure or phoenix head almost. You know, yeah, definitely looks like a phoenix coming off. And I was particularly keen on finding uh, was researching when the tides were going to be to to give us that kind of mixture of of different water types and that swirling of, of the waterways. And I remember getting caught out, Scott, where I was thinking I want an outgoing tide. Uh, to get the most color kind of willing to meet the ocean. And then the pilot was actually, actually, wait a minute, you might not because the water is so stirred up um, inland that when it's coming out, it's actually gray and murky. And that's what's going to be moving out into the coast, which is kind of the opposite of what it's after. So in the end, I just had to run with it. And uh, and that's where local knowledge comes in is, is you know, traditionally somewhere like Broome, if you, if you go out on the outgoing tide, you get this beautiful kind of aqua, teal waterways coming out mixing with the ocean and that's what you want whereas here is the other way around it was actually the the murkier muddier water that was coming out and mixing with the with the clearer um aqua coastal waters but anyway as you anything you just run with it there again you can see our um our, uh, our little bird friends here and and that slight separation of, of the different kind of types of water and again that's the reflective capacity of the light kind of bouncing off and, and giving it a different sense of a different tonality and that kind of moves and that's just a very very slight change in angle and instantly there's you know you, you're losing that silvery effect and moving into more of the the deeper kind of yellows and browns of, of, of those structures and it's bringing the greens a little bit more to life as well you can see that kind of mouth-like structure and that eye-like structure as well and the further the further you went back the the more different a kind of creature it looked like so you could really kind of play around well, um, in that previous one, any idea what those lines are? They're not like crop tracks or something like that. <laughs> oh, what do you think, Scott? Yeah, like there's there's a lot of like when it is dry season and and the waterway is out. There's there's heaps of other creatures around, like um, uh, cattle and potentially camels and um, you know things like probably emus. Like there's there's big creatures that do walk out on these. Um, sand, sandy sort of mud flats and things like that. Um, it'd be interesting if it was a crocodile. That's good. We looked. We we didn't find a croc, but we looked. <laughs> yeah, we did look pretty hard. It doesn't mean they weren't there, especially with water that that's is that murky. Mm. Yeah, it's sort of, it's a bit standalone. It's really not obvious to me, Lucky, what what would have caused yeah. it. Um, again, you know, a different kind of more oblique angle. Um, of the opening, you can see the waterway kind of coming out of the ocean and, and that, those murkier waters kind of reaching out and mixing. And, and I love those tidal lines. I, I find them really intriguing, even just as, as subject matter on their own. Mm. And there I sort of included some of the more literal kind of vegetation, just to ground it a little bit and, and give you a bit of context. So it's not just like an alien form floating in the sky. This is a straight raw shot, I think, but... But it gave the example of what we're working with. You know, there's very, very subtle, refined kind of striations through here of similar kind of patterns. And then you, you get the deeper 
sort of murkier and and more moist kind of features here. So we are at a really nice time of year where we've got a bit of both. So we've got access to some of those areas that were drying out and giving a lot of really refined, really fine level structure. And we still had quite a bit of moisture and even big areas of water still out on the open plains that that gave that reflective capacity and, and gave a different color palette because this would be a totally different image once it dries out probably in a few weeks or, or a month's time even. And that is an example of the interplay of the two, you know, the, the moist sort of area over here to the side and that darker color palette and this, I don't even know how you describe what's going on there, but it's, it's just a little bit wild. I find this sort of image and I find it really kind of intriguing. You can, you can rest and spend time with different areas of the image and, and have a very different kind of a mode of experience, I guess. Um, it's almost like a staccato kind of noise going on here. That's just grating on you. And there's a, a soft fluidity and gentleness up here and a more earthy and grounded palette. This, this feels very ungrounded and alive and vibrant. So it's kind of a, some ways it's a bit of a difficult image to spend time with, but I think that's what makes it a bit intriguing. So I've got a few images of the more, the kind of obvious larger structures, I think, just to give you a sense of, of what we're playing with. I haven't actually refined this edit at all to, you know, what I feel like might be water or anything. I've just threw images in that sort of tell the story of the place. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, that's a, this is another one of the challenges, I guess, is how do you simplify a landscape like that? And particularly these kind of fractal coastal waterways, it's a lot of the features they aren't sitting in isolation. So it's kind of up to you whether you isolate a very, very minimalist part of a feature. Like if you, you can do a square image straight out of the top of this, for instance, flying over or just catch the edge here of different sort of features or, or you know, just move into a larger, blockier structure with a wider lens. It's sort of, you know, and you can see that kind of warped kind of sense of, um, dynamism in, in terms of how the shapes are almost like wrapping around each other it's that's kind of a bit hard to wrap your head around in a way from a from a planar sort of sort of perspective it's a little bit more sort of top down and again you know like this is kind of the base and and these are kind of probably the more striking features at the top but it's quite hard to just pull those out but an obvious shot to me would be maybe cropping it into the square on the top here or a, or a rectangular shape for the top and this is where you know, having a zoom lens and or having a lens, having a, a system with a higher resolution capacity gives you choices to go in there later. So later on, you can come in there and just make this a vertical shot on its own. Um, and, you know, because to me, that, that's the most simplest kind of elegant part. You know, it's kind of messy at the top and, and refined, messy at the bottom and refined at the top. But I just wanted to include a bunch to give you a sense of, you know, it's not actually that easy to get your composition. So you've got to keep working them out. Uh, and this is an example of, you know, the space in between. Um, and that's, you know, you could, you could turn this around to the side and crop it and make that just one of the shots there, for instance. Or you could pull a square image into the top left, maybe, and, and work with, you know, the circular kind of flow going on around the top. Um, that has, you know, a simple kind of base. I think this is when we stretched our wings and went quite a bit further to the east and just had a bit of a play, not really, really knowing what we're going to find. And yep. We ended up having to go a lot higher, didn't we, Scott, because the features were just so massive. Well, and they, they were quite spread apart once we started going over that, that mud salt flat. Um, so, yeah, the, and, but very different, again, the structures and, like, the way the, I guess, the, the sand and the salt and the mud had dried out was, was quite... Um, yeah, they were a little bit sort of dry area. out there, and they were a lot taller, too, from memory. Mm. A lot sort of more angular and thinner yeah. in terms of their features. They weren't sort of bulky and solid. They were more sort of thin and drawn out. This particular area, like I, I kind of wish I was shooting with a longer lens like like Scott was at the time because the real beauty of it was in the real fine detail. I think I actually cropped in on this one to get that sort of, sort of detail. So here is an example of um, that golden light we're talking about. So mm -hmm. again, you know, it was very, very early. It was literally, we, we were in the plane flying before the sun came up. And it literally was coming up as we we're heading out to the coast, and and you know, knowing that that was happening, um, you know, out of the right hand side of the plane, like shooting into the sun, all of a sudden we got this beautiful blue gold palette, which which I found absolutely fascinating. And a lot of my favourite images from the trip are, were playing with that that sort of colour palette. This uh, I find a bit of an unusual kind of composition, but it kind of works. You've got this resting kind of structure, like leading up and leading into this sort of larger, bulkier, more grounded sort of feature. And, and you've got the, um, 
I guess the juxtaposition of two very different aspects of, of the kind of features you're going to find out in the landscape. And they're connected a little bit by that thread of kind of goldy yellow running through the middle um, and a bit of an eerie kind of steely, steely gray blue kind of wrapping around them and, and juxtaposing that warmer sort of tone. Um, yeah, this was a really unusual kind of water feature in the middle, just stretching between this almost like mini islands. Like you get a sense. It was such I mean, a hard feature places. to, it was such a hard feature to photograph too. Like, I know we, we were around it quite a few times and, you know, it's what angles, how wide do we go? How high do we go? You know, what do we sort of isolate in and, and, and kind of separate from other features? Now this example where I just separated one singular Kind of feature one of the islands and and there's a little bit of dapper light i think on some of these flights which i also thoroughly enjoyed you don't have as much control about where it's going to fall when you're flying around certain uh features it just does what it does and you just got to work with it and sometimes it can be distracting but i often find it gives I mean, there's a bit of more depth or a little bit more point of difference than than something that's just you know obviously you can see that kind of slight separation in, in the dapper light there's some darker light here and light around the outside and it just kind of separates features a little bit more and gives you a little bit more areas to slow down and pause on before you move to others, which I think I quite enjoy. Again, you know, a difficult area to, to create a simple composition in, but sometimes I just let the chaos reign, <laughs> go a bit wider and let it all in. You know, here's where I kind of zoomed a little bit further and, and worked to kind of isolate it to, to give it this kind of um, diagonal flow through the top and bottom. And there I was emphasizing, you know, outside of the depth of light, there was a lot more warmth going on. And that was being highlighted by the way the light was hitting these kind of more yellow and orange structures um, and separating. But this is a little bit further to the west and we're going to that exploratory east, sorry. We were going to that sort of exploratory area and we didn't quite know what we were going to find. And again, that was, I think if you're up at about 7,000 feet and shooting straight down, you, you get some of these features in and their whole structure. But uh, I, I sort of wanted to play around with that diagonal kind of flow again and just shoot from a certain angle and isolate certain features. We did have these beautiful, I, I kind of surprised myself in that, you know, the fractal structures are, are incredible, but it was actually the color palette around these, would you call them islands, Scott? What would you call them? Yeah, yeah. I, I think they're just small islands that probably stay there even when it's extremely wet. Because, you, you, I mean, you know, in the wet, they're, they're pretty much, you know, the areas around them are pretty much going to be underwater. And so when we're there, we're in the end of their kind of, I mean, when is the wet season kind of finished? Like April? Yeah, so kind of, May. We had a, April, May. It's kind of had a month or two to start drying out, but this, it's still, you know, got a ways to go. So again, we were there kind of at a time where you've kind of got a little bit of the qualities of both seasons, I think, to some extent. Um, but I actually really enjoy when things start drying out, particularly areas that were a kind of like, you know, salt, salt plains like this, they, they, they tend to sort of, bring out a huge amount of texture and there's really really subtle separation of tones and, and color around them um, again you know i don't know what would you what would you say was creating these these linear features scott you know would you no, say I'm sure like they they do look like tracks and i think some of the other shots i've got as well and definitely in the wet season you but see to me that just has to be a track i don't know something <laughs> roaming cattle or, or camels i know i don't really have camels they have camels up in that part uh, you can get camels everywhere. Yeah. So this is another version of what Scott did. Like it's, I was sort of working on that sort of diagonal, you know, I was waiting till we came around and, and also like how much of that reflective capacity that I, that I wanted to get in and give it to more of a steely open look. So you'll notice that because of that reflection, the, um, the lightness of the waters come up, whereas at a slightly different angle with Scott's, that water's a lot sort of darker and deeper looking and literally within a second, it's going to change. Um, as we're flying and circling around a feature. Um, again, you know, that's playing with reflection. You know, if you just top down, that actually is just a, almost like a bit of a soft sort of gray sort of look, but it sort of lights up gold at, at a certain angle and it creates a lot more separation between, you know, the main stem feature and where it reaches out and branches out into the more southern kind of areas. Whereas, you know, at different light, they're actually a lot more similar to each other and they don't separate as much. So this was actually that feature that Scott was talking about. Oh, wow. Where he literally isolated one little aspect of it, I think, in it about here. And yeah. uh, actually, it could have been this one. I think it was the one on the left, yeah. Yeah, I think it might have been one on the left. And, and that was something that caught my, 
caught my eye. You'll notice in the video, you, you'll see me kind of poking my head around both sides of the plane and, and trying to sort of reach around and get a sense of what's around us. And I think it's a little bit easier to do that in the front of the plane because you've got more of a front view as well. But I'm constantly kind of searching and on the hunt because uh, you you're in a new place. You don't really know what you're going to come across. And as much as you've researched on Google Earth, it, it's not necessarily going to present the same way relative to the season and local rain events and different things like that. So you really got to keep your eyes peeled. And, you know, so, so I was directing, I think on the first flight and, and then Scott was directing on second flight. And we were a little bit, a little bit of both, I think on the third flight, or yeah. sort of the old sort of tap on the shoulder. Do you want to tell the pilot to go that way type, type thing? Or what do you feel about going to that? So lots of sign language going on, lots of noise, <laughs> uh, lots of wind flow. And again, you know, like how many different different tones of, of color? Mm. You know, there's blues and steels and, and grays and browns and oranges Copper. and rust yeah. colors. And, and, you know, you can work on that file and separate all of those sort of a lot more. Uh, but that's what I found maybe quite most fascinating about that particular kind of area. Uh, I'll probably crop it a little bit further when I go into actually editing these properly. They're just um, sort of 10 second Lightroom grabs really pretty much. Um, again, you know, I'm trying to think about where I want to go with an image like that. You know, there's a little bit too much going on. How do I simplify it? Um, you know, and again, like I said, you've got, you've got those choices of, of go with the chaos or, or uh, cut into simplify. They're, they're the two kind of main directions you often find yourself going in um, to try to get some sense of balance, you know, or flow. Like here, I just sort of lent on flow, I guess. Um, I could probably, if I edited, emphasize the separation and, and, the cooler kind of shadow blue areas and the, and the warmer kind of areas of light. And again, that stuff with light sort of doing its wonderful thing, which I really enjoy. You know, that could work as a, as a square crop from the top, for instance, probably quite well, because um, the bottom area is probably a little bit more distracting. Um, again, going back to that broader, very, very pastel feeling kind of palette, that one there, like it, you know, I didn't want to push a contrast lighter on that one because I actually really enjoyed the, the softness of the way the tones kind of blend into each other and move around a little bit more and, Give each other a little bit of room to breathe. Uh, again, you can kind of see the reflections coming in from the sky on the top. And, you know, that was another area we spent a bit of time on over here. And that's actually quite a strong aqua waterway on the top left there. Yeah, a combination, you know, a, a very large kind of feature. Um, you know, they wanted to give just a little bit more of a breathing room. But again, you know, it's probably not the kind of feature that would isolate super well in terms of the different elements of it. It kind of works better as a, as a larger kind of feature. And, and the interest comes from, you know, how it separates itself from the environment around it, or maybe how it even interact, interacts with it to some extent. Yeah, that's the aqua that I was talking about. So, you know, at certain angles, you know, it comes up as a reflective kind of white or even gold. And, and when you're at a certain angles again, you, it'll pull out this, this, these really sort of deep aquas. Um, yeah, very, very rich sort of color palette. And I'll get Scott at some stage, maybe soon to maybe, share some of his images he, he took basically um, at the end of the wet season. Um, again, the variation on these fractal patterns is just, it was just, it just sort of felt limitless, I guess. Just everywhere I looked, there was a different kind of version of it with a different kind of feel, you know, some of it more subtle, some of it more gritty, some of it more elegant, some of it refined, some of it very raw, uh, some of it very bulky, some of it very thin. Uh, it was just, yeah, just sort of, endlessly beautiful variations um again that's an example of maybe moving into a feature and which you can probably see i think is this section here where i'm actually trying to isolate and simplify the composition a little bit more uh, and give it a little bit more balance like i said i'm showing you a lot of my sort of raw sort of just give you a taste for the place um this is an example of you know that very very early reflective light so there's still quite a lot of moisture or even water on the, on the top in particular. And, and that early light was just sort of beaming and reflecting off, off the corner. And you kind of see, if you look closely, there's that deep aqua is actually in there, but at that particular light angle, it's not really a strong feature of it. It actually, it's more the golden tones and it's a beautiful comp color complement. Those, those sort of golds and kind of soft blues, you know, that, that tends to be a palette that works really well with a few little pockets of green separating it out. But that's, yeah, I think that's probably just going through it right now. That'll be one of my, one of the ones I'm drawn to. Maybe spending a bit more time with and, and seeing where I can mm. go. You know, there, there was a lot of. I did spend quite a bit of time, as Scott's done as well, trying to isolate some of the more abstract features. And 
you know, moves it into, you know, an abstract sort of painting kind of aspect or, or homage to different sort of styles and it's leaning more purely on texture and shape and form and nothing else. And it takes that context completely away. Um, and square kind of gives, often gives things a very graphic kind of feel and um, gives it a bit more grit, I think, a bit more structural kind of power. I'll just do a few more then I'll swap back to you, Scott, if you like. Yeah, no worries. Um, again, you know, I think I did a shot of that where I separated it. Again, we've got that beautiful reflective golden light sort of coming in and sort of separating the, the, the blues and the golds a little bit more. I think that actually that's me doing what I said I was going to do and actually cropping in uh, to a square sort of crop on, on that kind of feature just to emphasize that, that kind of left to right, top to bottom diagonal flow. Yeah, this top down was just magnificent. And again, you know, this 20 minutes later, the shot wouldn't be there because of the kind of light that was falling on it was just absolutely stunning. Um, and that would come across as probably a fairly flat feature during the middle of the day or in higher light. Yeah, again, that's that's just an image I included just really to show you because there it is literally reflecting off the sea. And if you get down low enough, and this is where the height relative to your subject and distance becomes a real issue because you're only going to get these kind of shots for a second or two. Uh, on the features that you want to photograph, but you have to be at the right height and shooting into the sun at the right angle to get them. And I don't know what happened here, but this sort of looks almost like crystal <laughs> or something to me. Um, yeah. It's just so separated and, and refined and, and crystalline in its structure. And uh, I don't even know how to describe how to describe how that that was literally there for a couple of seconds as well. That's a totally different shot a second or two later. Um, but yeah, if you keep your eyes peeled and just be ready for anything. Uh, again, you know, this is another element that, that is very much about that golden light. And again, the blue and gold tones, it's really working together really beautifully. Um, again, you know, timing, 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 light, light, light. Like I have shot a lot more at, at high light, midday light in the last few years and still been really happy with what I get. But sometimes this is a certain magical element that comes through. You're only going to get at that very, very late and early light. So the so the landscape photography in, the, in, in me has always kind of gotten in the back of my mind. And so I'm really, really happy with that morning light in particular, Scott. But um, I'll stop there for a while and um, give Scotty the floor again. And um, I don't know how far away you are from maybe some of those images. No, I've, I've got them, I've got them ready. So I can um, I'll start with a wide view so then at least you get a view of what it's like during the wet season. So during the wet season, um, I know when we were there, it was March, and um, there's still a lot of areas that, you know, the landscape was, you know, there was dry sort of um, structural sort of patterns around, but there was water everywhere. So when we did look at the landscape the first time, and this was the first time I'd ever been there, so when I was looking at it, um, I was looking at it from a, sorry, I know I've gone grey, but I'll bring it back up. Um, it's like it's like getting painted like I, over each time, Scott. Yeah. So I was looking at it oh, from wow. basically the first time I, I came here and I was like, wow, where do I start? And, you know, there was so much water in the system. There was water in, like, every part of the system, in the estuaries, in the, in you know, all the structure. You know, every, every element had some sort of water um, surrounding it. So it, it was very different and obviously very green and lush. But the one thing I did notice was the more I started exploring the area, the more it started to reveal all these colours that I didn't even think would be there. Um, <clears throat> I'll bring one up that shows a good example. Uh, go with this one. Sorry, it's a stupid program I've got for sure. <laughs> what are you using, Scott? Just out of curiosity. Uh, it's, just, it's just the Windows. Oh, here you go, Windows. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this this is just some structures there, but there was there was so much. There was blues and purples, and you know, lots of um, different sort of reds and browns within the color system. But the system was just lush, like everywhere. Everywhere was like vibrant, you know, lush greens and and reds in the in the waterways themselves. Yeah, bigger, much bigger emphasis on the on the greens and, and blues and. Kind yeah. of reds, I guess, from what I can see. Yeah, let me, I'll bring up one of the wider shots. It's got a bit more colour in it. 
yeah, I was sort of shocked when Scott first showed me just 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 how different it was. Like it's really massively different. I mean, the structures are there, but the way you relate to them is really different. Because a mm. lot of the features that we were shooting and I was isolating were actually underwater. Yeah, and and look, the more I sort of looked, like at first I was obviously because I hadn't seen the area before, I was I was focusing around the structures and the elements and the patterns, and then the, after you know first day of shooting, I started to look more in the in the, the floodplains and the open areas where there was nothing but water, um, and I started to get closer and closer to things that um, yeah, really sort of emphasised the colour and the the details in there. I get a tricky question, but do you have a preference, Scott? No, it was it was very tricky. Um, you know, the 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 thing about the wet season was there was just lots of colour, and you know it was quite vibrant um, <clears throat> everywhere you went. And look, you know, an image like this where there's just hundreds and hundreds of tracks, and you think, you know, that waterway it's it's mud. Like anything that would walk in that would be sinking to some degree. So it must be some fairly big animals that can make their way uh, through these sort of waterways and these mud flats and these salt plains. Uh, yeah, it's funny how, how the, um, they almost look like gold, all the different um, steps of the animals in that feature of the tracks. Oh, wow. It just is vibrant, like, there was a lot of, a lot of like, like I said, a lot of greens, a lot of, a lot of deep colours. I think that's the one thing about the wet, wet season. A lot of the colours are a lot deeper. Like you know, you, you deeper sort of browns, you deeper greens, you deeper blues. Um, found that when I was exploring the area, that I felt like the the colour palette was very similar across uh, the range of the areas, um, but everything was vibrant. So. Where you had greens, they were vibrant greens. Where you had reds, they were, they were vibrant reds. And this is this is just layers of water on whatever the landscape is below. But there was just such such a different amount of color. Let's see if I can. Yeah, I noticed like like it, they all seem darker too. You know, you, you talk mm. about their richness, but it has quite a different aesthetic and quite a different mood to it uh, yeah. from an emotional sort of point of view because of that as well. I think. It doesn't have that. Doesn't have any of that kind of drier, more open, deserty kind of feel to it. Um, it's, uh, it's it has a much kind of more moody, or organic, richly organic feel to it. Yeah, I I felt that like wow. you, you always felt that there was <clears throat> going to be really strong uh, sort of vibrant color wherever you shot across the landscape, um, and even in the areas where it was a little bit dry. It was still, you know, a darker landscape because I guess everything was wet. You know, even though the areas had dried out, there was still like layers of water that were probably just below the surface that were, you know, revealing themselves. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask Scott, um, having been there a couple of times, uh, you have, uh, not me. Um, yeah. What are some of your your tips for traveling there. What what are some of the things that you need to know if you're going to go up to the Gulf Country and, and have a look around in the area? Yeah, look, I think um, the one the one thing that was quite um, interesting for me is so when we were doing our trip around Australia, because of COVID, we got stuck in a lot of places, and uh, this was on my list to come to. And we were I was aiming to be here around. September, October of 2020. But because of COVID, we got stuck in places, you couldn't get out of places and you had to wait it out. So by the time we got here, I didn't want to miss out on the area. So um, it was a bit of a fluke that I came up here in, in the end of the wet season. And even getting up here at that time of year is very difficult because majority of the roads are underwater. And even when we came in here, we had to we had to detour by about 400 kilometres to get into to Burktown on a road that was not underwater because most of the roads were still somewhere between one to three metres underwater. Wow. And you, you think, you know, how is this possible driving these roads in dry season? 
But when you get up to a waterway or a, a low area of land, um, these floodplains, like they, they literally, you know, you can see the depth um, that the water has come up to during the floodplains. The one thing that's interesting about the area is that um, as soon as the rains stop, the area actually dries out or the water, water reduces quite quickly up in these areas. So it's only a matter of months before it goes from being three metres underwater to being, you know, back to a level where you can drive through again. So, yeah, I think logistically about getting to a place like this, um, you either drive in and take your chances in towards the wet season or you wait till completely the dry season. Once it's a dry season, there's there's a lot of roads in to these areas and, and they are... Um, one of the places we went to, Kurumba, uh, which is, I think, maybe a couple of hundred kilometres or 250 kilometres to the east of uh, Burktown. Um, that, um, that was more of a touristy place. So a tourist town with lots of campgrounds, lots of accommodation, um, lots of, you know, facilities there. Right. Well, lots being a relative term, but yeah. Yeah, but well, I think lots in terms of compared to Burke. Lots of crickets. Yeah, yeah. Lots of crickets. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, getting up to a lot of these places, like, you know, it took a bit of research finding out what was there, what what was possible. Yeah, and the, two, the funny thing is, like, I've, I've contacted multiple operators in the last two years about doing stuff up in the north parts of Australia. That's anywhere from you know, WA, um, NT to North Queensland and the Gulf and stuff. And, you know, you can always tell that these one man shows or these one woman shows because, you know, no one ever responds to email. Like it's just no one responds to email. You have to ring these people up to even get their attention. And even when you get their attention, it's like, oh, yeah, maybe we can do that. Or, yeah, maybe uh, we'll see. You know, it's all it's all very vague and, you um, you know, it's it's such a a process to just you know get anything in these regions um, happening. Um, so yeah, it, it takes it takes a bit. Like I think you know, obviously most of us know that if you if you want to do something, everything's possible. It just is how, when, and how you know how hard you want to do it. Yeah, great. Right. I'm going to keep sharing stuff while you're talking because um, yeah, no worries. We're um... We're uh, starting to run along time-wise. But um, again, here's, uh, here's that beautiful reflective light, you know, just a broader shot that I probably wouldn't use, but it gives you that sense of where you can now work with, you know. You just see the hints of the gold just running on the edge of those waterways. It's just magnificent. Um, and, you know, reading, reading the weather ahead of time, knowing that you're going to get a gap in the clouds in the morning, uh, using apps like Windy, which, which Luke's an absolute master of. Um, getting your timing sort of right. I think I should have earlier, sorry. Um, yeah, you sort of, world's your oyster in a place like this, depending on how low you fly, how high you fly, what angle you're shooting out at, sort of what time of day you're working with. And as we've got a lot more clarity of with, with Scott is what season you're working at. So, so so many more of those more open, bright kind of yellows and soft browns and and gentle greens and 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 whites actually, um, from what I can tell, relative to those darker kind of blues and deeper deeper greens and almost like purple kind of tones that we're going through. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of Scott shots in a different season. Like I'd, I'd be fascinated to go back at a different season and shoot it again. Um, and I have no doubt it would have a very very different aesthetic. This is my um, elephant eye. Or a dugong eye. I don't know which one you want it to be. It's, I think it's a crocodile, to tell you the truth. Oh, oh you like crocodile? I see little eyelashes <laughs> here in the eye. Yeah. Um, it's a circular shape. That one just sort of really stuck out to me when I first saw it. Crocodile, yeah. We didn't get to see croc on the strip, I don't think. No. A little bit, little bit surprised by. Um, I think if you took a, step, a bit... in the, step in the water, you would have found one. <laughs> yeah, I was like, a few times. Because the water's so murky at that time of year that it's kind of like, you know, take your risk how close do you get because they're obviously the ambush creatures and, and they just sit and wait for you to turn up and offer them breakfast, lunch or dinner or an afternoon snack. 
So it's weird, sort of, Nick, when you're up in the country, just constantly wondering where they are and how close they are and whether you want to, you know, sure, I can't, I haven't seen anything, I've been here for half an hour, should I go a little bit closer to get the shot that I want? And yeah. that, might, that might be the exact wrong moment to, uh, to have a crack at that one. <laughs> I suppose you're, you're probably better off um, shooting with a longer lens and staying back where it's safe. I, I think uh, for the for the uh, for the, for increasing the likelihood of staying alive and keeping all your limbs, absolutely. Yeah, and you I know, guess not... you've got to keep one eye on the uh, one eye on the, uh, the what you're shooting and one eye on what's happening around you. <laughs> yeah, don't turn your back to the water and just be kind of ready. I actually just found this shot yesterday. It's um, I sort of gave it a little bit of a nudge with it in terms of contrast, but it's it's rare to find something that is essentially flat feature to, to give you that sense of dimensionality and layering, uh, as well as that kind of rich texture. I, I just um, posted on Insta last night, actually. I'm, I'm really quite fond of this image. That's, That's one awesome. of the few images that I spent more than 10 seconds on, probably probably spent 30, 30 seconds on. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question from Erin, who's asked, um, uh, may I ask, do you pre-focus and set manual mode, or do you auto-focus when that high in the air? Um, I know someone like Tony Hewitt often does manual focus and I know people will already tape their lenses to the exact focus that they want. And, and I think that works if you stay at a kind of similar height. Um, I think the autofocus on something like my R5 is so damn good that, uh, I don't have any issue whatsoever with leaving it on autofocus. I, I think it's a little bit dependent if you're shooting like really big, open, featureless salt flats with very little for contrast, something like this, maybe for the camera to get a hold of or to grip onto. Uh, you can sometimes get a bit of hunting going on. Um, but I personally find that with the modern camera systems in particular, the DSLRs, um, phase I found maybe a little bit less capable, at least the earlier phases in particular, uh, which I've used a few of. I think the newer ones are a lot better. Um, but I'm, I'm quite comfortable and I think a lot of my colleagues are, are fairly comfortable. Scott, how about you? Yeah, uh, look, most of the cameras these days, like you said, they're, they're pretty performance enhanced so it's you know the fact that you are traveling at high speeds and you know it it just makes life a bit easier to shoot you know automatic autofocus sorry i think you can you can pry around a little bit with sort of how wide or how open you have your um your focus points like whether it's spot focus or whether it's a broader kind of area so it's got more capacity to grab onto things like it's a little bit less of an issue, I think, top down. I think um, you want to be a little bit more aware if you're shooting oblique where your focus point is um, because yeah. you're trying to maximize the depth of field. You're including things that have a lot of physical depth away from you. And otherwise you'll get pretty soft in the corners depending on what aperture you're shooting at. Um, again, you know, even though low light's so beautiful, you've got to watch um, your exposures are changing quite quickly with something where you've got reflective light straight into the camera and then two seconds later that reflection has gone and it's relatively dark um, around you. So you get a bit of jumping around in terms of that sort of thing with that early light. And you've got a little bit less flexibility with your ISO, I think on the really early low light, but same time, I don't really find it. There's quite a lot of reflective capacity to the subject matter I found Scott and I, I managed to keep most of my shutter speeds at a reasonably high, I think, um, which is what you want. Uh, that's, that's the one thing you don't want to compromise on is, uh, Shutter speed's king for aerial work. Like you, you can kind of deal with noise a lot more than you can deal with physical blur. It's sort of what I find. This example of just isolating something to just go really, really abstract. Might even be the edge of, of that lake. I'm trying to think. Yeah, maybe it is the one edge of it, I think. Um, yeah. I'm like a, um, I do like that angle of the lake that you've taken. Yeah, it's a little bit sort of more. Uh, which one? The first one or the? The, the abstract. Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I, I was sort of like, oh, well, that's that's a straight shot. It's sort of crop. It was just a thought that I had in there, like, well, that's just, you can, you know, I can, I can rotate this as well, and it, it's kind of, mm. I don't know, it works top down, I think is kind of an interesting one. It's got to play on where, the, I do spin my images around quite a lot. I'll often just do 90 degree spins all the way around and get a sense of where the visual weight of an image is and where the kind of structural balance lies is, because they feel very, very different often depending on, on what position you put them in. And with an, with an image that's totally abstract, you've got all the room in the world to go where you want. There's no kind of rules and there's no reference points that are necessarily going to you know, make it feel awkward or, or different from depending on um, what angle you end up falling on. 
Um, whereas the really obvious structural features that you're a little bit harder to do that with um, because your, your brain's got it clear, you know. Here again is, is a wider shot to give you a sense of the interplay of the different, and the dynamism of the different kind of features and kind of the way the ecosystems sort of start interplaying with each other from the rivers to the salt flats and, and, and the mud sort of waterways and the mangroves. Yeah, again, that's a little bit of that reflective light just highlighting some of these different areas and, and up the top as well. Oh, Scott, I want to go back. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> Indeed. Again, you know, just a, just a real pastelette kind of brush. Yeah. I'll just sip through these last ones because we're, um... do you have many more you want to show, Scott? No, I think, I think I've, we've covered a good range and um, okay. gives people an idea of what it's like up there. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they've they got a pretty good, pretty us awesome. again. You know, we, you've seen that feature in a reflective capacity where it's totally different, mm. um, more of a, a simplistic kind of um, color palette without that, but still a little bit of side light there, just giving those, giving it a little bit of structural depth in there. So I was I was quite drawn to these big open areas. Scott, as you know, I kept tapping you on the shoulder, saying, "Here we go over there." I hope you don't mind. There's not a lot that of time was, for conversation great. when you're up there, but when you're, when you're both sort of forking out a lot of money for every minute you're in the air, it's sort of, yeah. you, you want to have some sort of common common cause about what you're after or a little bit of breathing room about being open to, to maybe. So Scott went to some areas that I would have gone to and ended up getting shots I wouldn't have got and, and probably vice versa. Um, and I found that on a lot of my trip, you know, flying with Tanya Malkin, I found the same thing. She, she flew to areas that I wasn't drawn to and then I really surprised myself how much I enjoyed it once I got there um, and shooting over someone else's shoulder, so to speak, and getting a real sense of, of how their, probably how their mind works to some extent, how their, how their creative eye sort of works as well. Um, and as you can tell, you know, Scott and I got really different shots and we're literally leaning out the same window the entire freaking time, um, shooting the same subject matter. So it's, you know, it, it is a quite a complex environment. So you can actually isolate features quite easily and quite quickly in terms of, um, you know, creating quite different sort of final sort of material. That's the cover shot I actually used for the um, the show this week. Mm. I don't yeah, remember you know. where that bit is. Where is that bit? <laughs> oh god. Well, well, I actually remembered on the last flight to um, to hook my phone up as a GPS because my camera doesn't uh, GPS. That's right. We put the GPS on, didn't we? And uh, again, you know, I learned from Scott uh, the particular program that that was going to work well in order to do that. So um, let me just say, I must be getting close to the end now. So, yeah, I'll just went through I made a couple. That's a wider kind of one of that, that one that I sort of zoomed in on. Oh, yeah. Really, I did a shot just in the top, and that's totally a different image, obviously. But yeah. it has its own sort of appeal as well. It's almost like a cradle that's kind of holding it at the bottom. Um, but getting yourself in the position you want is, is really not, not sort of that easy, really, um, some of the time. Again, you know, that's a little bit about lighting, that, that little dance of, of light and that dappled light just creating that separation between the two and bringing the yellows out and the greens at the top, whereas uh, there's a blue bluer greens down below. You know, that's that's a that's a second of the making that shot. The second before, the second after, it doesn't exist like that at all. Um, again, I think I just separated. Um, this was an issue when I just started playing with last night. Uh, again, you know, trying to get a sense of dimensionality um, in a flat plane, it's sort of quite interesting. And light's your friend in that regard, particularly good side lighting. Uh, this is an example of where that um, aqua kind of colouring comes through. That's giving it a bit more breathing room. That's that's one of those features that, that had a bit of space around it. Again, like similar to Scott, that's probably one of the closest shots we've got to each other, I think, Scott. Um, but again, you know, you can you can edit things in a different way to give it give it a little bit of separation. But so one of the things that we did right at the end, which I really enjoyed, is our very, very last night. Uh, it was, I think it was Scott's idea, wasn't it? What was what were we doing again? Well, our last night, the sunset tour. Oh, uh, yeah, to the, um, in Corumba. Out we to put the, on our tourist hat, didn't we? The island. That was our, yeah, that was our tourist bit. And it was fantastic. It was literally a sand island um, out in the middle of the ocean, just sitting on its own. I think I actually have a... Um, so I did a, I thought, Scott, I haven't got a, I haven't got a um, profile shot of you. So I banged <laughs> out one of those. And we literally chugged out to, on a boat, landed on this island, which looked like it should be underwater. It's about a foot high. And, you know, they bring out the, the champagne and the, um, the and prawns. The prawns and and the... Of course, Scott and I just took off instantly the other end of the island <laughs> out of shooting. And 
<laughs> flying drones and catching the sunset. And uh, actually, this got there, sort of getting the Australian up. He was first in the best rest on that one. And uh, I was absolutely stunning. Just absolutely beautiful way to finish the trip. Absolutely gorgeous sunset. And uh, and I love the owner so much. I was thinking, oh, I could probably um, probably take a little bit of video from him. He might be able to use. He was kind of the guy that was really obviously um, open about the fact that he didn't uh, didn't know much about marketing or <laughs> how to do that kind of thing. <laughs> And so I'm gonna, I'm, the, I'm just gonna send this to him. And thank you. You know, it's the kind of, um, uh, but they'll love it. <laughs> kind of promo material, and and you know, when you're a professional photographer, and, and Scott actually taught me a lot about that on the trip about, you know, keeping your eyes open and your mind open to, you know, creating any material wherever you are under whatever you're doing that that may have commercial capacity. You know, Scott does a lot of work speaking on your behalf, Scott, where where he's gathering material uh, that can be used, you know, by different organizations or different films and different things in the future and and i haven't really been going around with that kind of mindset and you know luke's actually been really good at reminding me to to shoot back and do some of these oblique kind of shots um in order because they're the kind of images that tourism boards and things might actually use rather than my own kind of personal uh, motivations which are very much about um you know creating my, my art and, and using using nature as, as just a specific palette really uh, but I still got to put food on the table. So um, as long as it doesn't jeopardize the, the um, art, I suppose it's always hard to find that balance, isn't it? So I don't want to yeah. influence you too far one way, Paul. And then all oh, of a sudden you, all of you. No, I'm, re- I'm really enjoying it, <laughs> Luke, to be honest. And, and I'm really grateful. And, and I think it's, it's keeping my mind a bit more open and, and being a bit smarter about, you know, because investing, I must—I don't know how much we spent on this flight. In fact, we're still waiting for the bill, aren't we? So, <laughs> we're waiting. We're, we're dreading the bill, aren't we? <laughs> we're sort of like, oh, you know, we'll be right. This is out. This is our. Uh, we finally put the put the cameras down, and they were kind enough to save us a little bit of a, the food that we'd actually paid for because we were running around taking photos the whole time while everyone was having having wine. And I got a lovely lady to to take one last shot. It's got nice. So that was uh, pretty much our final final shot of the trip. Nice, nice. So uh, Scott and I have been chatting and we are quite interested in, in putting together a package to bring some people up, up there. It's, it's quite a lot of logistics and better know how to, to get yourself uh, on the ground up there because it's, it's, as you probably got a sense, it's, it's quite a commitment to organise something up there and, and to understand the lay of the land because there's, there's, there's a lot of limited kind of um, resources. But um, we've got a pretty good handle on it, Scott, especially being up there a couple of times. So so we'll keep you guys posted as to as to when. Um, we'll keep an eye on um, Scott's website in particular. He's a, he's a lot better than me for um, what have you got on there? 20, Twenty four different. I think he's helped me today. So and that's all around the planet and around Australia, of course. So yeah, I'm probably the, pla- the, the planet's on hold for a while, but Australia, I keep finding you know beautiful hidden gems. So it's definitely something we can share with uh, a few people. Scott, is there any? Um, is there anything you want to share in terms of how people can look into your work a bit further or, or, um, guess yeah, look, I, I guess, do? yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. Like even what Luke and Paul were saying a minute ago about, you know, the fact that, um, you know, I shoot everything underwater, aerial, wildlife, whatever. Um, but you know, and I think Luke makes a good point where it can can sometimes shift your focus from the artistic creative side of things. And it was a conversation Paul and I had, probably almost every day about that balance. Um, but yeah, me and, me in general, look, majority of the stuff I do is I take people to different places around the world. Some of my workshops are photography based workshops to learn certain aspects of things. Others are facilitating things for uh, professional photographers and film crews. Uh, so I've been doing the logistical side of things for such a long time for more than a decade and even you know the fact that there's a lot of places you need permits for there's a lot of things that take you know anywhere up to a year to to get permission to go somewhere um so yeah a lot of the stuff i do um is looking for places that are you know quite unique different remote you know and will you know anyone who's a photographer you know would see this as a place that they would you know be able to be quite productive in. So, yeah, so a lot of stuff I do is that. So my tours range from a variety of different things and I do collaborate with heaps of people because, like, you know, I learn so much from someone like Paul. Like, you know, he's, he's a master. 
you know, in every sense of the word, like, you know, cricket any, running master. any discussion you have with Paul is actually quite a fascinating one and quite informative and always a, a learning, um, a learning moment. So, yeah. So yeah, from my point of view, I'd probably be working with some amazing people like Paul and at other times I'm taking people to different parts of the world doing different things. So, you know, if you'd like to join me or us at a certain point in time, yeah, definitely hit me up. I've always got something interesting on the, on the go. I've always got a plan that's at least two to three years in advance. So I know, I know what's going on that far in advance for a lot of stuff I do. So scottportelli.com? scottportelli.com yeah you've got five websites i think you told me <laughs> uh, yeah well it's because i do different things so i've got one you know for taking people to swim with whales i've got one for my photography i've got one for the tours like but yeah scottportelli.com or even just scott.portelli on instagram and you'll see a lot of the stuff i'm doing and like paul said earlier actually a lot of stuff i align with conservation work so i do a, a lot of different stuff that probably doesn't get seen in the mainstream side of things or doesn't sort of culminate into a project or an event or an exhibition or a book or anything like that. But it's stuff that I work on that I'm passionate about in the, in the back, you know, behind the scenes. Oh, I'm sold. Where are we going? <laughs> Wherever you want. <laughs> Sign me up, Scotty. <laughs> we'll get, yeah. get something better than the juicy van next time. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I actually think of that very fondly. I, I had some, Fantastic sleeps with the beautiful nights up there, and a very very affordable option. Well well done, Scott and Paul. <laughs> I don't know how you found that thing, given that there was just nothing available almost at all in entire North Australia. Nick, I hope you you got a little bit more inspiration for heading north at some stage in life, Luke. Yeah, mate, that's uh, fantastic. Yeah, really beautiful area, and and I've really taken with the Jabiru. I don't know what it is, but I that's the yeah beautiful bird and. and yeah, I'd love to get up there sometime, and I'm sure I will, but uh, not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, stunning, stunning creature. And again, you know, being around someone like Scott, I, I, I learned a lot more, a lot more appreciation and sensitivity for, for wildlife in particular that I often just sort of breeze, breeze past and enjoy. But um, yeah, yeah. And I think on some of my tours that I've run, where I've ended up, I think I ended up in Kakadu at, at the um, Australian Bird Conference or something, <laughs> I ended up saying, when in Rome and jumping on a tour with some of the best of the best and with your own people like Scott that have that sort of depth of knowledge and understanding and commitment and advocacy for, for wildlife and, and wild places, it, it really rubs off on you. So absolute privilege, Scott. I think I got some of the favorite images I've got, I think ever in my life. And I really have to thank you for that, mate. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Over. I'm happy that, you know, everything went well and you, uh, really enjoyed the the experience like and for us getting to know each other that was that was amazing too like you know, yeah that was gold seems like we're still friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know we, we're definitely right in each other's pockets that's for damn sure 24 yeah, 7 we're, we're sleeping in the same car or, or or banging in the same plane or, or spending eight hours a day in the, in the same camp kitchen where we, we were or 10 hours drive in the same car back on the same day and, um yeah we did we did well indeed absolute privilege scott and um yeah an amazing part of the world uh, like yeah thanks. indeed I've, I've been this has been this kind of like blank area to me in terms of my knowledge of australia and and it has been for a long time and it really took someone like scott's sort of vision and and um motivation and invitation to get me up there and so lucky i pulled it off and and i got away almost scot free through the COVID <laughs> lockdown cycle um scotty poor old scotty's actually caught in sydney now but um He's like a rubber band, so the second he's free, he's going to be out of there. Oh, know. yeah. <laughs> Packing the car and crossing the border. Uh, awesome, Luke man. and Nick, thanks for uh, your patience for letting us kind of uh, take take the show tonight and take the range. No worries. No. It's been amazing and um, yeah, really yeah. great to get a um, see the swathe of images that you were able to come back with. And um, I'm sure there's plenty more there that you haven't even been able to attack yet. Oh, so. Most of them probably, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, no, that's great. And Scott, we'll have to have you on and again another time to um, talk about all of the other amazing work you do as well. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I particularly Always love happy. your um, cuttlefish work and that kind of stuff as well. So there's, yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah. plenty there. You're up to like there. an underwater so, wildlife um, show sometimes, Scott. Yeah, um, that's yeah. 
it, it's mind. definitely it's I, definitely veering away from your landscape. Um, no, that's all right. Um, I think our viewers really <laughs> appreciate yeah. having a bit of variety and yeah, um, and it's always interesting to learn different things. Yeah, and as, especially we get like you know, and I'll jump at it all the time, but especially because there's so much going on in Australia with you know Australian marine life and you know the cuttlefish is a good example. You know they the population was almost decimated. You know in 2013 and 14. And it recovered over five years when the government put a ban on fishing. And then now they've released that ban, which means everyone can fish them again. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, things like that, that, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, part of, you know, what, you know, that education process that you need to go through with a lot of um, that sort of stuff. But there's amazing stuff in Australia that I think we're so lucky here. Mm, absolutely. All right. Well, on that note, thanks so much again, Scott, for joining us and um, all the best um, with um, your future exploits. Um, and Thank hopefully you. we can have you back on soon. Um, and um, I'll catch you later, everybody, um, and see Nick and Paul next week as well. Um, until then, uh, catch you later. Thanks, you guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for having bye. me. Bye. bye.